Right. Council, the recording has started and you are live on YouTube, just so you know. Thank you for the warning. <laughs> That's J Rock. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're back to name that sound. <laughs> that sounds like James just dropped his false teeth. Something like that, yeah. That was an interesting sound, James. <laughs> I can't hear you. <laughs> Okay, Sean, are you all set? I am. Okay. Good evening, everyone. It is now 5.30, and this is the City Council Study Session for October 26, 2020. We will call this meeting to order, and per the Governor's Emergency Proclamation 20-28, the City of Auburn is prohibited from holding an in-person meeting at this time. City of Auburn Resolution Number 5533 designates City of Auburn meeting locations for all council, board, and commission meetings as virtual. All meetings will be held virtually and telephonically until King County enters into phase three, the Governor Inslee Safe Start Washington phase reopening plan. And Sean, will you please call the roll? Deputy Mayor DeCourcy. Here. Councilmember Baggett. Here. Councilmember Brown. Here. Councilmember J. Raj. Here. Councilmember Malinga. Here. Councilmember Stern. Here. Councilmember Trout Manuel. Here. Okay, any announcements, reports, or presentations? No, Chair. Any agenda modifications? No, Chair. All right, great. We will now move into our agenda items for council discussion. And the first item on the agenda this evening is resolution number 5549 with City Attorney Como. I think uh, I'll go ahead and uh, jump in to initiate the conversation, if that's okay. okay. Uh, sure. Go ahead, so, uh, for the record, uh, Jeff Tate, Director of Community Development. Um, what's before council tonight for introduction is Resolution 5549. Uh, this is an annual item that staff brings forward to city council uh, where we package up all of the fees that the city charges for different types of services in a variety of different departments. Uh, and we put that into one resolution that we bring forward to council for consideration that would go into effect on January 1st of the following year. So uh, several council members are familiar with this resolution. Uh, a few members are not as familiar because it's the first time through. Um, and one of the things that um, uh, of course, it's a pretty robust resolution in terms of the number of pages, and there's lots of different departments and services and fees represented in there. But one of the things that we wanted to highlight tonight uh, uh, were really uh, some of the fee modifications that are being presented by the Department of Community Development, as well as uh, uh, the Public Works Department. So I'm going to uh, make a few remarks about some of the community development fees and then turn it over to Ingrid uh, who can speak to some of the public works fees. Um, the uh, uh, one item um, 
uh, for anybody who uh, is watching or just catching up on this item for the first time, uh, is that back on September 28th of uh, this year, Community Development and Public Works brought forward to City Council a cost recovery policy. So we did that about a month ago, and we talked about uh, a policy that uh, for council consideration that would uh, help better align uh, the, the amount of cost or uh, money that the city is recovering from a variety of different types of uh, developer and property owner uh, fees that are paid uh, when applying for permit applications. Uh, so recall even further back that uh, we had presented um, cost recovery as a concept to city council during uh, the March City Council uh, retreat. Uh, so the, the marching orders that staff received was to move forward and look at what is our rate of recovery, uh, permit application fee by permit application fee. And when we presented that cost recovery policy last month, uh, we divided that into a few categories uh, or disciplines, building fees, land use and environmental fees, and engineering fees. And in that policy, uh, we identified uh, several factors that could be used to determine whether a fee should be uh, charged at a rate that allows the city to recover 100% of its cost. Uh, in other categories, it's 25 or 50 or 75% of recovery. Now, when I use the term recovery, I mean, how much does the city charge relative to how much does it cost the city to provide the service? So when we think about that, there are uh, costs that the city incurs like salaries and benefits, uh, software and technology costs, merchant fees when we're processing credit card payments, uh, the cost to acquire and maintain uh, vehicles, and the cost to acquire and maintain buildings that we work in. So after presenting the uh, cost recovery policy on September 28th, uh, uh, council generally agreed with the approach, but also expressed interest uh, and incorporating a fee reduction for lower income households, which I'll speak to in a minute. Um, as I said before, cost recovery uh, uh, and the development fees are primarily born out of the Community Development Department and Public Works uh, as well. Uh, and the, the portion that I'm speaking to, uh, which are the planning, the environmental and the building uh, permit fees start on page six of your packet and they extend through page 17. And in those pages, you'll see some other types of fees as well, like fire impact fees and business licensing fees. So as you look through those pages, pages six through 17, and you see strike through underlines of, or strike through of one number and replaced with an underline of another number, that's the proposed fee change. And those fee changes, uh, some are more significant than others, obviously, but those are intended to reflect the policy that was presented on September 28th. So two items that I wanna call out real quick. Uh, one is on page 14, 14 of your packet. And at the very uh, bottom of page 14 is a, um, a section that, that speaks to uh, building permit fee reductions. So what staff is proposing is that uh, we have the ability to waive a building permit fee, any kind of building permit fee uh, in, its, in, in full. So not just a reduction, but an outright waiver. And uh, two important features to that. One is that um, it applies to building permits. So when we were thinking about what council had talked to us about on September 28th, we felt that the appropriate place to, to put these fee waivers or fee reductions would be for folks who need to maintain their quality of life. And really that comes down to how you maintain your structure and everything that operates inside of a structure. So make, making sure that people uh, can maintain uh, potable water systems, that there's heat in their building, that they can keep their structure dry if they need to replace windows or roofs. Uh, so it really focuses on building permits and any kind of building permit fee. And then the second part is that to qualify uh, 
we would utilize other city programs uh, like the utility discount program or the housing home repair program because those are programs that are already in place that um, uh, evaluate someone's eligibility based upon their income. And when we think about having to make that evaluation, there's a lot of very private information that is shared with the city uh, in order to uh, obtain eligibility. So at least as a starting point to launch a program like this uh, would be to first uh, launch it by leaning on those other programs. Uh, if you qualify for the home repair program, you would qualify for the fee waiver. And when would that scenario come up? Well, when it comes to home repair, we have a certain amount of money as a city and we spread that money around to as many people as possible. But sometimes people have pretty significant needs on their home and they've hit the cap on what the city can provide. So they may need to do more work in their home. Uh, and that would be a, an example of where we would waive the fees for them to, to um, pursue those additional improvements. And also note in this language that we want to make sure that if a contractor is applying for that, we're ensuring we put into a place a system that allows us to be confident that the uh, contractor is not pocketing the savings, but it's being passed through to the, to the property owner. And then the um, second piece that I wanted to call out is on page 17. And it is at the very bottom of the page, uh, the last box, item 10. And that is uh, a newer feature, which would be to establish a 3% technology fee that would be added to uh, a variety, not all, but a variety of the different types of fees that we charge. And technology fee is something that's become very common in a lot of municipalities. And it really is to cover the cost of the fact that we are emerging, the industry is emerging into greater reliance upon uh, technological solutions for submitting permits, reviewing applications and communicating with the customer through online portals, uh, through issuing permits. Uh, the development industry, uh, namely the Master Builders Association has been an advocate for establishing this fee because it actually saves them money. They don't have to pay staff to come to a city and write a check and sit at the city front counter um, for their permit to get issued. They can do it online and it also offers basically a 24 seven kind of interface with city service. Uh, so that's a, that's a feature that I thought was worth highlighting as well. And with that, I am happy to, I think actually I'll just turn it over to Ingrid and um, uh, when Ingrid concludes, uh, if there's any questions for either of us, we can both field those. All right, thank you, Jeff. Uh, so for the record, Ingrid Gow, Public Works Director. So similar to Jeff, a lot of what we changed in our fee schedule you heard about in the discussion on September 28th. In addition, we had two uh, other conversations with you on October 12th related to the traffic impact fee update, which is included in the fee schedule, and also uh, the change to the right-of-way use permit fee structure, which is included in, the, in this updated fee schedule. Uh, in addition to that, we have a couple other things that are included in there just to touch base on in case there are any questions. So in our utility permits, while we have the typical annual increase of the 6% that we discussed on September 28th with the council for all permit fees, we also have our SDC fees in there. So that's the system development charges that are related to all three utilities. Those fees, a few years ago, the council enacted code that basically we in include an increase annually to match the construction cost index for that. And so that is what that has been updated to based upon the current construction cost index. And then the last item in there uh, for us is the airport fees. Um, so we have several changes that we're making in some of the miscellaneous permits and fees for the airport. And those were discussed with the airport advisory board last week, and they did vote uh, to recommend approval of those changes in those fees. I will note that we are maintaining the hangar and tie down fees. We're not adding an increase on those because of the current conditions and the pandemic. And we don't know what that impact is gonna be on our tenants. Um, and then you'll also notice that there is a flowage fee added into the airport um, fees that is for Jet A fuel. And that is because we have entered into an agreement with Cascade for them to actually resell 
jet fuel on the airport to other uh, users rather than just their customers. Uh, the, all of the public works fees can be found between pages 18 and 35 in your packet. Uh, with that, if there are any questions, I think Jeff and I will be happy to answer. So Jeff, I have a one, a couple quick ones here. Um, I know we've reviewed this in very great detail uh, during our study sessions, but can you just walk us through once again uh, the increase for the development agreement and amendments on page seven, and also the environmental impact statement fee increase on page eight. Yes, yes. Let me um, uh, flip to those pages real quick. So uh, I see the development agreement and then the environmental review uh, fees on page eight. Is that what? The second one was, or which one's on un environmental impact statement? The environmental impact statement on page eight at the top of the page. Yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna assume that part of the reason that you highlight those two is because they're pretty significant. Yes. Um, so uh, first of all, on the environmental impact statement, um, I will say that in ten years of working here, we haven't done one um, that's been privately initiated. Uh, we've done several uh, environmental impact statements that have been publicly initiated uh, by the city. So we don't charge ourselves that fee for uh, an EIS. But an EIS, um, and you can tell by that cost, uh, is a substantial amount of work. And it's a process that will take uh, anywhere from 10 to 18 months or so uh, to work through. You see an environmental impact statement often with um, agencies who are updating plans, like if the flood, pl flood control district is updating a plan or the uh, King County's uh, watershed resource inventory area is updating a plan. An environmental impact statement is a very intensive review process where you identify um, uh, alternatives. It's called an alternatives analysis. And it's uh, required by state law and uh, it requires a uh, pretty significant expense in terms of preparing a document because it's got to evaluate alternatives within 18 different categories of the environment. So those categories might be archeological and historic preservation. You could have 20 pages written on that subject alone for one proposal. Uh, wetlands and streams, um, uh, infrastructure. Uh, there are a lot of categories that you evaluate and when you evaluate all of these different categories of the environment, you have to prepare um, a preferred alternative. So there are these three, four, five different alternatives that are evaluated through the analysis. And then it becomes a very intense public process. Uh, lots of, not just an opportunity, but requirements under state law that uh, the public be uh, invited in, encouraged into a process to evaluate the appropriate alternative. Um, so when we, uh, when we identify a process like that, uh, that's probably worthy of uh, an hour long presentation of what an EIS is and what we go through and what the requirements are. Uh, but it's, it's many, many hours of staff time. And uh, an example of where an EIS might be submitted to the city as a private developer is if a private developer proposed annexation or if a private property owner uh, wanted to um, uh, submit, most of the time those development agreements require an environmental impact statement. So a development agreement becomes a, uh, a different kind of analysis related to what's gonna happen on a piece of property uh, where you're deviating from what the comprehensive plan and what the city code says. So that's why it becomes expensive and time consuming because we've created these comprehensive plans, these zoning maps, these regulations that apply on different pieces of property. And if you wanna present a development agreement, you are going through a process which likely triggers an environmental impact statement um, that, uh, that is really setting up your own sub area plan for a piece of property. And it usually doesn't get done except on large uh, tracts of land uh, because of the, the complexity of the process itself. Very labor intensive. 
very rare to see. Councilmember Stearns has raised his hand. Um, Councilmember Stearns, go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I, I had a, a couple of questions. I'm, I'm, you know, not. I, I hope I don't go too far off here, but um, the first was on the fire impact fees. And I was just wondering why the casino ones are just so way much higher than any of the others. I think like restaurant and bars and lounge are like a dollar thirty or dollar sixty two, but casinos are three seventy eight. I'm just wondering why the fire and EMS fee is so high for that. Well, I hope this isn't too much of a cop out answer, but um, what the way that the fire impact fees get established is because of. Uh, a proposal by the Valley Regional Fire Authority. So when we collect fire impact fees, uh, the fire impact fees are related back to what the Valley Regional Fire Authority, um, I'm not, I'll say it believes, but it's not like they just pull this out of the sky, but what their opinion and position is in terms of what the ongoing cost is to serve that facility. An impact fee can only be charged on new, um, infrastructure or new buildings, let's say. You can't charge an, in, uh, an impact fee on just maintaining something that's already there. So if the casino wanted to add a thousand square feet to the casino, that's when the, that fee would get charged. That's, and it's a one-time fee, it'll never get charged again. It's only when the development proposal is, is submitted. And the fees really relate back to uh, technical analysis, they have to hire consultants and experts to, you know, assemble this, but what is, you know, what is the impact to that service provider, just like we do this for transportation and parks and, but, but when you grow, there's an impact on the, on the, the infrastructure that serves that growth, and that's what it's paying for. Uh, so it's hard for me to tell you why it's $3 versus two, but there is a methodology behind it, and it does relate back to um, a, a service provider, in this case, BRFA, what, how would they have to grow to serve that growth that is occurring at the casino? Yeah, no, I, I, I get the, the big picture, and I'm just sort of curious why. Yeah, um, it's a question for BRFA. Um, so I, I have another question, and it's... Um, about the animal licensing fees. We're not amending those, but I just noticed that like for seniors or a senior license, um, proof that the pet is altered and proof that the owner is 62 years of age. And I'm just wondering why it's 62 for seniors. Why not 55? Because I, I think our housing is 55. Yeah, and I hate uh, not being able to answer questions. Valley Regional. <laughs> it's, uh, well, we have a relationship with the Auburn Valley Humane Society, and those fees were set in, con in conjunction and in partnership with Auburn Valley Humane Society. So the, the reality is, while we collect the fee, um, fees help support that. Uh, and I don't know why that age was established at 62 and not 55. I, Thanks. I don't know. Other questions, Council? Okay, Jeff, just one follow up for me again uh, on page seven uh, regarding the development agreement and amendments. The That's another significant increase. We're just kind of walk us back through that one again. Okay, sorry. Takes a minute to get to the page and then under That's okay. Yourself, so. <laughs> Uh, so the development agreement, um, uh, again, it's a pretty rare process. This council, um, or at least a portion of this council, processed or considered an amendment to a development agreement last year with the Inland Group that is uh, redeveloping the drive-in yep. sector. Uh, a development agreement um, is basically, first of all, just for everybody's uh, kind of baseline knowledge, it is an agreement between the developer and the city. And the city council is the uh, authority to be able to enter into a development agreement. Uh, so this is not something that staff 
um, I mean, we shepherd it through a process. We facilitate. We want to make sure we don't bring forward something outlandish that city council shouldn't consider. Um, but uh, but essentially, someone submits an application or a request to the city to say, you know what, um, I've got 20 acres of land. Uh, it's zoned, let's say, R5, which is residential, five units per acre. But I really want a little more density. And for that, I'm willing to, to do more for the city because they're going to profit. Uh, so what they do is they, they come to us and they ask us, you know, what, do you, what kind of ideas do you have for additional amenities or as additional infrastructure or whatever it may be? And you enter into a negotiation process. And that process um, will trigger code amendments. It'll trigger oftentimes comprehensive plan amendments, amendments to our zoning maps. Uh, we bring forward ordinances. It has to go through environmental review. It's a very intensive process. Um, and again, something that probably uh, uh, on the short end might take a year. On the long end, as we experienced with RPG when they came to us, uh, at the drive-in site, it took many years to get through the development agreement process, but it is a negotiated process for how to use land that steps outside of what the zoning code and comprehensive plan uh, state for that piece of property. Great, thank you very much. And just as a, a point of reference on the fire impact fees, um, those fees are reviewed and approved by the VFRA Board of Governance and uh, for the seat of Auburn, Mayor Bacchus, Council Member Brown and myself are members of the Board of Governance along with other members of the city of Algona and Pacific. So those are presented to the Board of Governance and then they're presented to the individual cities for their ratification of the recommendations from VFRA. Any other questions for Ingrid or for Jeff, my council? Council Member Trout Manuel's raised her hand. Council Member Trout Manuel. Yes, on the same question that you were asking, uh, Deputy Mayor, on um, the fees, they also on the same on that same topic that you just uh, talked about. Uh, on the along the side of that, it has a a sixty plus sixty eight dollars per lot and unit. Does that um, is that a flat fee, no matter how large the plot or the lot is, or how do you measure that? Yeah, so uh, sometimes through a development agreement, what's happening is that new lots are being created through ultimately through a subdivision. So uh, we have a flat fee, uh, the base fee, and then that fee would escalate uh, the more lots that someone wants to create. And really that ties back to the fact that uh, it's a good indicator, a good metric to determine intensity or scale of a project. So if, if a development agreement only includes three or four or five additional lots, um, there's probably not a whole lot more work associated with that for staff than if it were one lot. But if you had a development agreement that proposed 200 or 300 lots, which is conceivable, uh, that's going to become more complex and more time consuming. So we build in, just like we do with subdivision fees, you'll see that as well, that the more lots, the more complex it becomes. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, any other questions? All right, Jeff, Ingrid, thank you very much. Appreciate it. The next topic on our agenda is resolution number 5556. Actually, Dr. Mayor, oh, we have, yes. have one more portion of that presentation. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor and, and uh, Sean. Uh, Harry Boshe from uh, Legal. Um, I apologize for being a few minutes late. I was having some technical problems getting uh, joined into our session this evening, but I'm here now. And I thank uh, Jeff and Ingrid for uh, presenting. Um, the portion from uh, Legal that I wanted to, was here to address as, from the fee ordinances um, section F, as in Frank, uh, the city clerk fees. We uh, are proposing a couple of amendments to the fee schedule for the clerk's office, and they both pertain to processing and handling uh, public records requests. The two changes are noted, I think it is on page 33 
Um, well, it's page 33 or it's also page 38 of 213, depending on which uh, set of information that you're looking at. But it's uh, section F like Frank, and they're down toward the bottom. The first request has to do with any um, public records requests that deal with specific information technology expertise in gathering and, and producing the records for the requester. Um, obviously, that is going to vary depending upon the request that's given, that the clerk's office is given, and you know, what it's going to take to compile that data and what kind of um, IT expertise is involved. Uh, so we're proposing a, a variable fee for that. The second um, that we're proposing is a charge for um, redacting of body camera footage. So under the state law, uh, requesters who make requests for, for police body cam footage under the public records law, uh, those are public documents as many other types of recordings are. Um, the, the public records law says that uh, certain types of information within that are commonly found or can be commonly found in, in police body cam uh, footage has to be redacted, has to be removed to protect individual privacy. And there's really four big areas of potential redaction. Uh, one is health related information. So for example, if a, a police body cam footage takes them into a hospital or into a setting where um, a person's healthcare information or health setting might be involved. Um, second is a more general area of just anywhere where a person might expect reasonable privacy, so, you know, an individual's home, um, things of that nature. And then uh, intimate images, intimate personal images, uh, or the um, body of a deceased person. So any video footage that's requested, if it contains any of those things uh, up on review, it would need to be redacted, uh, removed from the uh, video or um, pixelated or otherwise obscured. So it's not uh, viewable um, by the requester. Now, uh, that is a very time intensive process, a very labor intensive process, and uh, we are proposing a $60 per hour, uh, $60.25 per hour charge for staff time in making those redactions because of the time and uh, labor that is involved in doing that. Um, <clears throat> suffice it to say, it is, it is a very lengthy process, and it requires a complete review of all the videos that are subject to being reviewed or subject to being disclosed and then using the um, IT facility that is available to make the necessary redactions. The only persons that would be subject to the fee are people that are not directly involved in the incident that is captured on the footage itself. Um, so if, if people are directly involved in the incident or they're represented by counsel, uh, they can make the requests without charge for any redactions, as can um, there's a couple of um, other, uh, I wanna get the, the language correct from the, from the um, statute. The Washington State Commission on African American Affairs, Asian Pacific American Affairs or Hispanic Affairs. Those governmental agencies um, have the right to request these, and if they are redacted, they don't have to uh, pay the charge. So it would not apply to them as well, but it would apply to others that make the request. So those are the two uh, fee escalations or fee changes that the legal department through the city's clerks are, are adding to the proposed legislation. Okay, council. Deputy Mayor DeCourcy has stepped away. And so if we have the Muni service chair, chair the rest of the meeting, Council Member Stearns has raised his hand. Hi, um, thank you, Harry. Um, I was just wondering, that I, I seem to recall there is a case in California which said that the um, government had to pay for the cost, had to bear the cost of that redaction. Does that have any effect on us? Are you aware of that case or? I do not. Not exactly. If you send me the citation, I can certainly look at it and we'll, okay. we'll consider that. Um, we are adopting or proposing this ordinance directly in uh, response, 
if you will, to the recent revisions to RCW uh, 4256240. That's the state law that created the ability to uh, make charges for, for redactions. And I think it's the legislature's understanding that it's a, it's a labor intensive process, not just for us, for everybody who gets these kinds of requests. Uh, if you send me, if you have a case name or a citation, I'd be happy to look at it though. Okay, great. Okay, I'll, I'll do that. It may just be particular to California law. Okay, I apologize, Council. I had to step away for a quick second. Uh, any other questions for Attorney Boshe? All right, Harry, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, now we will move on to resolution number 5556 with Director Thomas. Hello, Council. I'm just going to talk for just a moment. I'm going to pass this over to our uh, utility billing and customer service manager, Joe Nelson, to give you all an update on the solid waste contract with waste management. So with that, here's Joe. Okay. Hello, good evening. I'm Joe Nelson, interim utility billing manager. I am going to share my screen here in a second. And let me know. And can everyone see my Auburn Saw Waste Collection contract screen? Yes, we can. Okay, we'll get started then. So I was last in front of you in July when we had brought to you the results of the solid waste uh, request for proposal process that we began last fall. Um, waste management was the proponent with the highest score. And so we spent the last few months working with them, finalizing a contract that we're bringing to you today for discussion. This is a 10 year agreement that will start uh, next October and run through September 30th of 2031. Um, probably the most exciting thing that I'm excited about is we're finally, after all this time since I've been with the city over 12 years, going to have one service provider for solid waste collection. So um, the map on your left is uh, shows the blue area is the area that is currently serviced by Republic Services. And starting next October, uh, waste management will be the provider of the entire city. So um, we'll be adding another Republic Services area is about 4,000 customers. So very exciting. Uh, the next is, this is the contract schedule that I had showed you back in July. We're now on number 10, recommendation to city council. Um, and then, for discussion and then hopefully at the next meeting, we will um, get permission to execute a contract. The next step is that uh, waste management will, will come to us with a detailed implementation plan that will list out the schedule of everything that's going to happen in the next um, nine to 10 months as we get ready for the implementation of the new contract. Um, containers will be delivered about a month to two months before the contract starts and start will be October 1 of 2021. So some of the service highlights, um, the biggest thing with this contract is we're changing the way our whole entire program functions. Currently the city is, we bill for solid waste along with our water sewer storm, and we also provide the customer service. So we are the people that when people have to call and want their container changed, they're talking to city staff right here and we are switching this up. It's, it's not common for cities to do this. Most cities have the solid waste provider provide the billing and the customer service. So we're kind of one of the last cities out there. Um, once we make this change, the other big city in King County will be Kirkland is gonna be the one, only, one of the only ones who bills aside from Seattle. But um, so that's one of the biggest changes is waste management is going to be our billing agent. Um, this is specific because the city is going to retain our solid waste fund. So we will still have um, the ability to set our retail rates um, and, and keep our solid waste fund, which is very important to us. But waste management will do the billing, they'll provide the customer service. It's gonna be a much more efficient process. So when people see that truck driving down the road, picking up their container, 
That's the same people they call if they have any service issues and the same people that they're going to get their bill from. Um, the other big thing is the litter crew services. Um, we had Vodis for over 25 years um, and they stopped providing litter crew services back in 2017. So since then we've been using um, Recology Cleanscapes and now we've incorporated our litter, con litter crew contract into our main solid waste contract. So waste management will have staff that will be providing um, illegal dumping pickup, regular litter pickup services, They'll assist with emptying some of the containers. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, also, uh, many of you are familiar with our bulky item collection event that we typically hold in April, where residents can put out large items, refrigerators, sofas, and they're collected at the curb for no charge. We are changing this program to be more of an on-demand program so that residents can use it one time per year and they don't have to wait. So if their water heater goes out in October, they don't have to hold on to that anymore. They can call up and schedule both the item pickup and get it taken away right away. So another thing, um, unlimited recycle for businesses. Current contract um, has a limit of 150% of the size of their garbage for what they can have for recycling. So unfortunately for a business that's doing a really good job of waste prevention and just has a lot of recycling, it kind of limits how much money they can save because they want to make sure that they have the big enough recycle container. So this way they can have a smaller garbage and they can have whatever size of recycle they need to, you know, for their needs. So um, we feel that it's, we feel strongly that that's going to help with our waste reduction um, and recycling goals for businesses. We also added a 45 gallon garbage cart option. Um, we find that, you know, extra garbage charges are not, um, cheap. And so we really found that a lot of people we would see, we take pictures of extra garbage. So we saw that, you know, a lot of people with these 35 gallon carts, they just have the lid up. So they just need a little bit more space. Well, the next size option was a 64 gallon. So they don't need double the capacity. So we really, you know, wanted to add some kind of size in between. So now we have that 45 gallon option. Uh, also start a new contract. We will have all new collection vehicles. Uh, so this is great because they're going to have the best technology available. Um, they're going to be as safe as possible, brand new, so less leaks. Um, it's a great thing to have all new collection vehicles. So the other big item is all new carts. So with this new contract, uh, residents will have all of their carts swapped out and we are changing cart colors, not to try to confuse anybody, but because we wanna be more consistent with the region. Um, compost right now is gray in our city. And a lot of people come in and they think that the green cart should be for their yard clippings. So that's what we're going to. Compost is gonna be green, garbage is gonna be gray. It's gonna be much more color friendly, I think, to people who come into the area. Some other highlights. Um, with this customer service change, uh, we will have a dedicated phone number for Auburn residents to call for customer service. Obviously, it's going to be a big change. We're going to be going from them calling a, you know, a call staff of four to a call staff, you know, a huge call center down in Phoenix. So they'll have a dedicated phone number. Waste management will also have what they call a customer service ambassador and a customer service champion. So these are specific staff that they've identified that will make sure that they are, are, and they'll actually come up here and tour as well, but they're gonna be kind of the experts down at the call center of everything about the Auburn contract. So that way, and also calls will come to them first before they'll go to other people. So trying to be as, as specific as possible for all the different caveats of our contract. Uh, we also have free carryout service for disabled residents. We have this right now, but there's a limit of 100. And we really felt like we didn't want a limit on this. We want, if there are disabled residents that have trouble getting their containers out to the curb, we really want to be able to offer them that service. Uh, we also, this contract has, um, with this contract will come a contamination reduction plan. And really um, with Many of you may be or may not be familiar with China Sword, but a few years ago when China um, stopped accepting a lot of our recyclables, contamination became a big issue. And so 
the haulers have to be much more strict on recycling contamination, um, also even organics contamination. And so there's a specific reduction plan in place so that we can definitely guide people and educate customers um, before we just stop picking up their container. So it details out a whole tagging process, calling the customer, educating them, um, a really great detailed plan. We also have um, with this new contract community events. Um, waste management has always supported our regular city sponsored events like August Fest and um, Kids Day but we also will have the opportunity to have two special recycling events per year. So these are for more of the difficult to recycle items like say electronics, or I always come to think of like tires, but we can decide the specific um, things, but they'll help out and provide containers and things like that and help organize those events. Um, we also have code enforcement cleanup support. Um, we haven't used this, but I can think of lots of different ideas of where, you know, code enforcement, maybe there's a neighborhood that needs to be cleaned up. And if we can bring in some roll-off containers that waste manage management is providing, and we just have to pay for the disposal, we could potentially help clean up some neighborhoods that really, where the people really need the help and can't necessarily afford to take loads to the dump. There's also gonna be three free storm event setups of yard waste per year. It's not a huge amount, it's like up to 96 gallons, but it does help when, um, if someone has yard waste, then all of a sudden there's a windstorm and there's extra branches in their yard, um, they'll be able to set those items out for free instead of getting charged for the extras. And there's also a Recycle All-Stars incentive program, just something kind of fun where um, people who are doing a great job of recycling can get rewarded. Um, for residential, it's five customers could get a month free um, garbage service, and then also for multifamily and business properties, uh, they can uh, have a pizza party and kind of celebrate. So just a little way to reward um, and try to have some kind of incentive for doing the right thing. Um, I do want to point out these pictures that I have. The blue container with the smaller lids, this is one of something that we do with trying to reduce contamination, especially at multifamily properties. Um, so by having the bar over and just the smaller slots, people can't dump whole bags of garbage into the container. So it makes it so they have to enter those recyclables loose into the container and helps reduce contamination. And then the bottom right hand corner, um, those are big belly compactors. So they're um, garbage cans that can um, have compactors and they actually also have technology in them that you can actually monitor them from your desk and see how full they are and see when they need to be emptied. So they're very expensive. They're about five grand a piece and we're getting five of those um, from waste management for no cost with the contract. So we can look at some of the areas where we have, you know, higher amounts of um, garbage can use or even litter and see where we might want to place those. So contract rates, um, the rates are going up. Uh, we were on a nice old contract that we had renegotiated. And I was told many times by waste management that our rates were not keeping up with the actual cost of services. So do expect a rate increase at some point. Um, that said, waste management proposal was $500,000 less per year than Republic Services. Um, we did go out for a competitive process to try to get those best rates, but um, we are making some major changes to our programs and those are, you know, those are part of the increased costs. Um, we will, as a city and looking at how we do things, we already right now, obviously we've done a lot of frozen positions and we're, we're kind of understaffed as it is, but as we switch out of the, um, the customer service and the billing, we'll definitely look at our group and see, you know, where we can find cost savings or just, you know, work on different projects that we'll to work on because we've been doing customer service for so long. Um, these rates are cost of service. One thing about that to remember is that each service sector is supporting itself. So residential customers rates are supporting the residential services, commercial supporting commercial. There's no cross subsidy. Um, no one is supporting another sector. So that's that was a big thing a few years ago. Um, so residential increase, and these are contract rates. So these rates in this contract are the rates we pay waste management. As I talked about earlier, we have our solid waste fund and we set our retail rates. So just keep that in mind. 
So residential rate increase of what we're going to pay waste management is it's 29 to 48 percent. It's it's a chunk. So 35 gallon garbage rate increases by 745 per month. We right now have not raised our retail rates since 2014. Um, we've had a pretty robust solid waste fund. Um, garbage kind of follows the economy and the economy was doing really, really well and our solid waste fund was growing. So we haven't had the need to increase rates. Now we will, next year we'll be coming to you because we'll have to set our new retail rates. But thankfully we have a solid waste fund that we're gonna try to feather out and kind of buffer some of this rate increase so that we're not um, dramatically increasing the residential and commercial rates to the best of our abilities. And that is what I have. Any questions? Okay, questions for Joan Council? Councilmember Baggett, raise your hand. Councilmember Baggett. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, Joan, just one question I had relative to the uh, difference between the 35 and the 45 gallon residential uh, dumpster or, or uh, retainer. What's the difference in price between the two, that uh, 45 being an option? So we don't actually have a retail rate for that yet, but contractor rate um, is, um, so it's about a $6 difference in what we pay waste management or contractor rate. Is that uh, anticipated to be passed along to the uh, retail or is uh, that gonna be increased? So right now, I mean, our 35 gallon cart is $16 and 11 cents right now. Um, if you look at these contractor rates where, you know, the new rate is $23 and nine cents, that's quite a difference. So like I said, we're going to try to buffer it, but you know, I don't know what that 45 gallon rate is yet until we do our rate study and figure out where we need okay. to be. Uh, if I may ask one additional question. Uh, are you, do you differentiate uh, rate wise between a uh, uh, like a mobile home park versus a, a resident, a single family residence? So mobile home parks are they receive kind of residential style service, but they are considered multifamily because we bill the park. So they're kind of a different entity, but they do they receive com commercial multifamily rates. Because Which is probably more than residential, right? It actually, right now, the way the rates go, it depends. The smaller containers are a little bit more, but the larger containers are actually less. So it depends on what size. So, um, but again, that's something that we'll look at when we do go to our retail rates and redo our retail rates. Thank you, Joan. Appreciate it. How's Howard J. Rogers raised his hand? Hi, Joan. Um, uh, I have a question for you on the contamination of recycling. Uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit? So there's two different types of contamination with recycling. Um, one is actually just people put garbage in it, right? They dump garbage in the wrong container. Um, other are, you know, you have your wishful recyclers where they really think something should be recyclable and it's not in our system, right? We have certain guidelines and things like plastics. Plastic should only be bottles, jugs, and tubs, but everyone really wants to put those clamshells in and the plastic wrap and plastic bags. So uh, mm -hmm. any of that, anything that's not on our guidelines is considered contamination. Okay, so the, the recycling stuff that we have right now has got a little sticker on top of it. Mm -hmm. And that's what we go by. Would that be still available on the new one? Yeah, so they'll have, they'll have, and obviously things change over time. So those new parts will have fresh new decals on them, with lots of pictures. So, okay, good. Thank you. Yep. Councilor Retrop Manuel, raise your hand. Yes. Councilor Retrop Manuel, go ahead. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Yes, I was just, we're a little confused here. Uh, my husband and I, we do a lot of shredding since he started working here from home. And um, we were putting it, emptying it out in a, in a plastic bag. And then we were throwing it in the, um, the recycling. Mm -hmm. Well, when they came and picked up our, our, our recycling, they says, no, you can't. They even made us take it out of the recycle. 
and says, no, you have to put it in your compost and empty it out and no plastics. So what is it? <laughs> Cause so, then. Yeah. So with paper shredding, um, yeah, it should not go in the recycling um, because really if it's in a plastic bag, it's going to get thrown off in the garbage anyways. Cause it shouldn't, nothing should be bagged in the recycling, but it acts like confetti. Um, if you were ever at a material recycling facility, all that shredded paper just blows around in the air. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't get recycled. We recommend the, and then the compost is what, so the compost, if you talk to Cedar Grove, they really don't really want paper shredding only because people shred credit cards and plat and the plastic windows and all of that becomes contamination. So what we really recommend is one, you don't need to shred. Like if you have a piece of document that has your address on it, just rip your address off, throw that away and recycle the rest of the document. Um, or use one of our shredding events in the spring and the fall, King County Recycling Collection events, the city contributes money towards that. And you can bring um, big file boxes and they'll shred them and those actually get recycled. Um, so the best thing is to try not to shred unless you have to. And then if you do use a shred event, otherwise it, it really should go in the garbage. Okay, so then also not to shred credit cards and stuff like that? You can if you're going to put it in the garbage, but they just, Cedar Grove does not want bits of plastic in that compost cart because that okay. is contamination to their process. Well, thank you for educating me and now I'll explain it to my husband. Thank it's you. It's complicated, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's actually very good information because uh, we do shredding as well. And um, we've been apparently not doing it right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I appreciate that. Any other you made me for... feel better, Claude. You made me <laughs> okay, feel <good>. better. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions for Joan? All right. And Joan, I really appreciate your uh, efforts in looking at the rates and how you're going to look at, at using some existing um, uh, methodology for uh, as we go forward for potentially increasing rates for residential. So thank you for that. And uh, great job on the um, um, putting this contract together. Um, it's really exciting seeing the changes are being made and especially we're getting all new equipment. That is really impressive. So thank you for all the work you and your staff have done on this. Thank you. Okay, we will now move into item 5C, which is the recap of the 2021-2022 budget and major re revenues again with Director Thomas. Hello, Council. I'm Jamie Thomas, I'm Finance Director. I'm going to share my screen. All right. So um, a lot of what we're talking about tonight is going to be recap of all of the information that we went over in quite a bit of detail um, back in September during our council workshops that we had reviewing um, the proposed 21-22 biennial budget. So today we have published our preliminary 2122 budget document. And that budget document is all of the information that, like I had mentioned earlier, that we had gone into great detail um, with you back in September. So we com compiled all that information together and we put together a preliminary um, budget um, document together. And so I'm going to spend some time just going over high level review of the elements of that biennial budget, as well as talk about our, 21, our 2021 property tax levy that we have to have um, adopted and to King County by November 30th. So with that, um, a quick review of our budget calendar and what it looks like between now and the end of the year. So today um, we're going to be doing the budget review and a review of our estimated 2021 property tax levy based on the most current information that we have from King County today. Um, the assessed valuations and the new construction values those all continue to change um, between now and November 30th and actually even through the end of the year. So a lot of the numbers, um, any, if any given time you ask me what our estimated property tax levy is going to be between now and the end of the year, it's going to change minutely, but there will be some subtle differences depending on the um, most recent information we get from King County. Um, next week at our regular council meeting, we will have um, two public hearings, and these are required by RCW. The first public hearing um, is a public hearing that we're required to have on the preliminary budget and um, take public input on the, uh, the biennial budget process. 
The second public hearing is required um, for us every single year when we adopt a property tax ordinance. So any considerations that we are any that we have for increasing our property tax levy for the future year, uh, we will um, we need to have a public hearing for that. So that's next week. We'll have our two public hearings. Following that on 11-9 at our study session, it isn't going to be as big of a presentation that evening, but there is a lot of ordinance documents that um, we will be publishing in the agenda bill process. Um, and this year we have a lot of ordinances um, tied and related to the biennial budget process more than normal. So one is the actual ordinance for the biennial budget itself. Um, we will have the ordinance for the capital budget we have an ordinance, we actually have two ordinances this year for property tax, and we'll talk about those um, later in the presentation when we're talking about the, 21, uh, the 2021 property tax levy. And then the final ordinance is modifying our utility tax code. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, but as you recall, um, an important element of our 21-22 budget is increasing the utility tax rate on our city utilities. And so that will require um, additional action through its own separate ordinance. And then the very last meeting um, related to budget, biennial budget, will be on November 16th, and we'll have a final public hearing, and that is on the final 21-22 budget. So that's assuming nothing has changed between now and 11-16, and our final budget looks the same. It could potentially change. I don't expect there to be any changes, but if it does, then the final budget would reflect any of those changes between today and November 16th. After that final public hearing, then um, council will adopt all of that budget legislation um, that you will be seeing on the ninth at the prior study session. So this is the same calendar actually that I shared with you um, at our final budget workshop back in September. This is just a lot more detailed information. It's got a list of all the budget legislation. Um, we will talk a little bit about um, the BNO tax ordinance a little bit later. That is not something that we will be adopting um, quite yet, but we can talk about that a little bit later and answer any questions that you might have on that when we get there. So jumping right into our 21-22 budget. Again, this is just going to be an overview of all of the department budgets that you have already heard from each of the department directors as it relates to the general fund. Um, in 2021, total uh, general fund expenditures um, are proposed to be $82 million and $85.6 million in 2022 for a total of $167 million over the biennium. Um, these two charts, um, these two pie charts, really just kind of divide that $167 million a couple of different ways. It slices and dices the information a little bit differently. Um, the first chart on the left shows how that department is divided out by each of our general fund funds. So we've got the non-departmental fund, just as a reminder, that fund is where is a place, it's where we put all of the costs that aren't really necessarily attributed to any other department. So there are costs that benefit the whole city or, um, or all the departments or our costs that we are mandated to do. So our biggest, our biggest expenditures out of there are our left medical, um, our left medical premiums and our healthcare costs, as well as our fire pension payments. We also pay for our Auburn Valley Humane Society fees out of the non-departmental fund. And then we have a small amount of debt, um, general fund debt service that we also pay out of the non-departmental um, budget. Um, we've got legal, finance, and human resources. They're all between four and 6% of the budget. Those are all of what we've mentioned before, our internal service type funds. Um, we are just very heavily salary and benefits, even though um, most of the city already is salary and benefits. The primary cost driving those internal service funds are salary and benefits, are, are the people. And then as you can see around the rest of the pie chart, um, Police, um, parks, arts, and recreation are a pretty significant chunk um, of our budget, um, as well as SCORE, which is our jail services, um, and then um, community development is the is kind of the last de department um, that's still a pretty significant chunk of the, the overall, overall pie. 
Um, then on the pie chart on the right is just a breakdown. I, you guys have seen this pie chart again probably 100 times. It's just a breakdown of the types of expenditures that we have, salaries and benefits obviously being um, a lion's share of it, and then services and charges, which are our contracts. Interfund services, those are the, those are the, the costs that our internal service funds provide for our general fund and um, IT equipment replacement and facilities. And so that accounts for 12% of the budget. Um, and a number that I didn't put on this slide, but that um, probably worth um, you guys knowing, total budgeted um, full-time employees that are budgeted out of the general fund are 369 FTEs um, out of a total of 453 FTEs citywide. So the majority of all of our FTEs are budgeted for out of the general fund. That said, there are some costs that are charged back to other funds, whether it's um, an indirect service cost allocations, for instance, um, some of our finance staff is charged back to other departments, or um, our staff time from public works, if there's staff working on capital projects, some of their time will be charged back to capital projects which are actually accounted for in other funds. So I say 369 FTEs are budgeted out of the general fund. It's a little bit misleading because sometimes there is offsetting revenue coming back into the general fund to account for those costs. So the next slide, um, that was uh, the, that last slide was a, a summary of our total ex general fund expenditures. This is a summary of all of the new programs and enhancements to existing programs that again we had um, brought to you and had discussed each one in, in pretty significant detail back in September. But just as a summary so you guys um, can see once again what we're adding back to both the general fund as well as some of our proprietary funds. So the top set of programs, those are all of our ge new general fund enhancements. Most all of those are enhancements to existing programs. They're not new programs. With the existing of the BNO tax program, that is obviously a new program that we have. Um, to recap, we have $150,000 in costs in 2021 that we're asking for, and that is so we can get a new um, BNO tax specialist hired and on board to help us um, with the full and final stages of the implementation of the BNO tax. And then 2022, you see a negative number there because the new program costs are being offset by our projected um, BNO tax revenue of $4.8 million in 2022. Moving down, um, there's two requests, two new requests for our internal service funds. Um, that's a Spillman support contract, um, which is a, a police software program, as well as um, the SWAT take home vehicles. And then um, the last group of, of new programs are our new ads to all of our other proprietary, our other proprietary funds and or capital projects funds. So before I jump into revenue, I think I'll just take a pause. Did anybody have any questions? Is there anything that didn't look familiar or um, you still had some questions on the expenditure side? Okay, so I'll jump into our revenues. So I'm really going to focus for this presentation really just our primary, our, our three major revenue sources for our general fund, which is property tax, sales tax, and utility tax. Um, the, again, the pie chart is the same pie chart that we've seen several times. And then on the left-hand side is a summary of how those re translate to dollars in our property tax, sales tax, utility tax over the, the biennium. Um, our property tax, we're budgeting um, to increase 1% each year, which is our maximum allowed um, by state law. Um, our sales and use tax, uh, we are, we discussed before, we're, we're budgeting for a decrease over what we had originally budgeted for 2020, taking into account recessionary pressures with an increase then a small 5% increase in 2022. So you can see that increase um, from $19.2 million in 2021 to $20.1 million in 2022. And then utility tax is the, is the only significant tax or significant revenue source that we actually have control over. So the property tax and the sales tax, we don't really have any control, we have very limited control at least as far as how much we're able to collect on those revenue sources. 
the utility tax, we do have some more control. And that is where um, strategically we've been talking about our fiscal sustainability and what we can do to help um, provide a sustainable general fund. And that's one, that is the primary reason why we see a large increase between 21 and 22 in the utility tax. That takes into account two things. That is our increased utility tax uh, rate proposal on our city utilities and also a, a business and occupation tax. For the purposes of getting all of the 21-22 information into one pie chart, I combined the BNO tax into the utility tax category. Um, once, once we're comparing, when we actually have two years of comparative information, I will break that BNO tax out um, separately in, in future years. But one thing I did want to highlight um, our, our, how our pie chart is shifting as far as relative percentages. So the property tax at 30%, sales and use tax at 25%, and utility taxes at 22%. This is the 21-22 proposal compared to in prior years, our 2019-2020 our budget, for instance, utility taxes made, made up 17% of our budget and uh, property tax made up 29% of the budget. So it's kind of shifting a little bit um, with some of, um, some of our revenue proposals. So going to looking more specifically at each of these um, revenue types, I'm gonna do the property tax discussion. Property tax can be really confusing and um, since we really only visit it once a year as far as how it's calculated and how it impacts the city, we'll I'll go ahead and, and review it again. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Like I said, it's not, it it's, uh, we back into our property tax rate and it, that's what makes I think property tax a, a little bit more confusing. So just as to reiterate, we are limited to 1% growth each year on our property tax. So 1% on what we levied in the prior year and then I have a caveat on here in here because this is actually going to apply to us this year, or we're limited to the implicit price deflator rate. So if whichever is lower. So generally that implicit price deflator rate usually is greater than 1%. So we default to taking the 1% because we can't go over 1%. But sometimes that I, Im, implicit price deflator or IPD for short is actually less than 1% and in which case we have to pass additional legislation. So the 1%, assuming we have 1% growth, that usually translates to about two, an additional $225,000 a year for us. We're also able to collect on um, property tax for new construction. So contra construction that was built in for, if we're talking about this budget, it was built in 2020, but we haven't yet been able to collect our tax on it. So we actually get to collect it next year. So that usually translates to about $225,000 on top of that 1% addition. So anywhere between four dollars and $500,000 a year is what we're looking at in increased property tax each year. And then this is um, our favorite little visual tool to show that for every dollar that uh, in property tax that an Auburn property tax owner pays, 16 cents comes to the city. So you can see that the school district in the state um, and the county um, take a, a very large portion of those property taxes that we pay as homeowners in the city. So um, that is the, the preface for property tax. And then I'm going to jump into the next slide will be our 2021 estimated levy. So like I mentioned, we're going to have two ordinances that need to be adopted by November 30th. The first or ordinance is um, what we call the substantial need ordinance. So if we want to take the full 1% instead of being limited to the IPD, which happens to be 0.6% this year, um, we, need to, we need to pass legislation that says we have a need, that we need that full 1% and that 0.6 isn't going to be enough. Um, we can bank that capacity, but since we really do have that need and our, our preliminary budget is built on the assumption that we're taking the full 1%, we do have a need to, in order to balance, um, to pass a, a balanced budget, we do need to take that 1%. So that's all that, that's what that, that ordinance will say is that we need the 1%. 
Um, and then the other uh, ordinance is our normal right, uh, property tax levy, which sets the levy amount. So um, in this case, our levy based on the numbers that we have from King County is looking like it'll be about $23.3 million. So that's that, that property tax or that second property tax ordinance establishes the total levy amount that we want to that we want King County to collect on our behalf. So how do I, we get that $23.3 million? We get the assessed valuation information from King County. And King County collects all of the assessed valuation information for both King County and Pierce County properties. And right now, the, the preliminary assessment information has property values increasing 4.4% in the city of Auburn, which translates to $12.8 billion plus an additional $395 million in new construction value. So what that means we're looking at $943,281,000 in, in, in increased levy over what we levied in 2020. So you're probably saying that's a lot more than that four to $500,000 figure that I had mentioned on the previous slide. And that's all related to the new construction value. So if you look at my little chart at the very bottom, I've got 2020 as well as 2021 for comparisons. And you can see the add new construction line, that's the third line down. We're adding $719,599 in new construction levy money compared to the $224,000 that we collected last year. So that just means we've had a, a lot of development activity in the city during 2020. So we have a lot of new value that has been that increased in 2020. We haven't been able to collect property tax on that additional value. So we'll be collecting on it in 2021. And that rate, that $719,000, just as a side note, is then because it was it's related to 2020, it's taxed at the 2020 rate, which is a dollar eighty one or a dollar eighty two if you round up per thousand. So it's good news. We are getting a little bit more money. The the nine hundred and or that that nine hundred and forty three thousand dollars is more than we had budgeted for, but because we don't have a final number yet, we won't true up our actual property tax revenue budget until next year when we actually have a final number. Otherwise, we're just chasing that number until we get final numbers from King County. So what this all translates to, it means the levy rate per thousand actually decreases because the assessed valuation has increased greater than 1%. So as long as that, in, that um, because we divide, the rate is a factor of assessed valuation divided by total, total levy amount, which we're limited to, um, the rate is actually decreasing. So our rate won't actually ever increase unless um, assessed valuation drops below 1%, and in which case our rate will increase. So preliminary numbers, our current rate for 2020 is a dollar, rounds up to a dollar 82 per thousand. Um, based on the numbers we have right now, we'd be looking at a dollar 77 per thousand assessed valuation. Does anybody have any questions about the property tax levy? I know it's really intimidating, but please don't be shy because it is complicated and, I, and we all recognize that and realize that. So if you have any questions, I will do my best to answer any of them. Okay, so that means you guys all understand it, which is fantastic, <laughs> thank you. So next, the next piece is moving on to our other revenue sources. Um, and normally I would just leave it at the property tax revenue since that's what's got, what is our required legislate. That's the only revenue that really has required legislation and under normal circumstances. I did want to bring up the other pieces of revenue that are critical in balancing our 21-22 budget. And that is um, the increase, the 3% increase on the utility tax rate for our internal utilities. Um, where that is expected to bring $2.5 million and $2.8 million into the budget in 21 and 22 respectively. That will be one of the ordinances that you will be asked to adopt um, in November. And then there's also the business and occupation tax um, that would go into place or would go into effect January 1st, 2022. 
with an estimated, we would be structuring the, the tax and the code to bring us in approximately $4.8 million in 2022. Um, that ordinance, we wouldn't, we wouldn't ask a council to adopt until first quarter 2021. We actually are meeting with the chamber on Wednesday to um, really just give some more information, solicit feedback, help build some context behind the financial situation that we're in, um, give them some of the options that we're looking at. For instance, um, we talked about the different th reporting thresholds that would make a, a business eligible, the rates, as well as any potential credits um, and deductions that we could build into our code. So we're soliciting feedback, but I think really just to just transparency and help frame the conversation a little bit as well. So they understand um, all the, city's, the city's position as far as business and occupation tax goes. Once we gather a lot of that information from those businesses, I think that will help the council then be better informed about which direction to move forward um, with some of the areas that we have um, in the areas that we actually have a little bit of um, room to decide what our thresholds are. I think once you are able to hear from the business communities, you guys will be in a better informed decision place to actually adopt an ordinance. Jamie, can I ask you a quick yeah. question on that? Sure. So um, we, I know you've had, we've had a lot of presentations on the b and and great information. Can you remind me again with the $500,000 threshold about how many businesses would actually be involved in the b and Yes, 991. Okay, great. Yep. And then also- I had all my data here, I was no, expecting questions. <laughs> no, that's okay. And then also on the 2% uh, the wholesaling, um, if we decided to go potentially with a square footage rate, uh, mm -hmm. can we do that? Or are we limited to picking just one of the options there? Uh, no, we can do both. Um, okay. Because one's a B&O tax, one is really a licensing fee. Gotcha. Um, yeah, we may, one of the things that we may consider, and I think it would be good to hear also from the, the chamber and the businesses kind of their mm -hmm. input, but it might be if we know that we're going to be capturing the wholesaler's fair share on a square footage fee, that maybe we hold the wholesaling rates we don't, we don't try maximizing those wholesaling rates. Or, so they're not okay. getting over, over um, charged, for instance. Exactly. Very good. Yeah. All right. Perfect. I'm glad you reached out to the chamber. I know we talked about it. I'm glad you're seeing them this Wednesday. So thank you for that. So then the other elements to the budget, not necessarily new, um, new revenue or anything that requires any um, action or legislation, but just good reminders of some of the things that we needed to do in order to still balance the 21-22 budget. And that is pulling in $1.95 million from the cumulative reserve fund into the general fund in 2022. And then um, we reallocated some internal service fund costs. So some of those some of those service costs are actually going to be absorbed in the IT fund and the equipment replacement fund. They'll use some of their fund balance um, for providing service. And that will save the general fund about $330,000 and some of those in inner fund service costs that they um, would normally be paying for. But the internal service funds will be paying for those costs out of their fund balance. So, that's revenues and expenditures. Uh, this is a summary of our our general fund our general fund budget. So on average, over the biennium, over the two years, expenditures will be increasing 5.6 percent um, over 2020, and then um, revenues will increase 7.8 percent over the biennium compared to 2020. Um, the, the drivers behind this is we really limited our program enhancements for the, the new biennium, and um, the, but our salaries and benefits are increasing about two to three million dollars per year. Um, that's actually, even though they are the major contributing factor to the increase in overall expenditure costs, we are not seeing uh, a LEF or a PERS increase. Um, over the biennium and not having those pension costs increases actually is saving our general fund quite a bit of money and, and not having those having those increases. 
and in fact, there's actually a decrease on the PERS side. So that helps, um, that has helped uh, keep those overall expenditures um, limited over the biennium. Um, our revenue increase, um, we jumped a little bit. Um, the main contributing factors is property tax, which is uh, on average $400,000 a year. As I mentioned earlier though, we're probably looking at something about double that for 2021, just based on the new construction estimates right now. Um, our utility tax of $2.5 million a year and our B&O tax at $4.8 million per year. Um, and then, and then in the end, you can see this also in the chart on the right, but we end our general fund ends 2020 with $6.8 million, which is our minimum fund balance requirement. And we also end with $4.6 million in the cumulative reserve fund, which you don't see here, but that is also our minimum requirement for our cumulative reserve fund. So we're ending um, the biennium meeting all of our fund balance goals for the general fund as well as our cumulative reserve fund. Has my Rebecca raised his hand? Thank you. Uh, yep. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, Jamie, I, I know that we haven't really talked about it very much, uh, but the sales tax affect uh, the effect of the COVID-19 uh, a pandemic uh, effect that it has had on the uh, 2020 budget and how we have compensated for that uh, by taking funds from uh, other areas uh, to make sure that we were not, did not have a uh, shortfall. Uh, are we going to address the sales tax or the effect on the sales tax for 2021? Because, you know, at the end of this year, uh, this pandemic is not going away. It's still going to be with us and it just, it's just not going to end at the end of the year. So I want to make sure that everyone's aware that we are really considering the effect that that might have on our 2021 budget. Yeah, we absolutely are. Um, that's, a, that's a great point. Uh, fortunately, right now, um, our sales tax is performing pretty strongly and we'll actually... Um, for when, when I do the third quarter um, uh, financial update, we can go into more detail about the sales tax and how it's performing. The really, the thing that's carrying us right now with the sales tax though is con the construction sector, which co not coincidentally is tied to that new construction assess valuation increase that we're seeing in our property tax. So we, between our elementary schools, as well as the downtown development that, that we're seeing here in downtown, um, our sales tax is pretty strong. But once those exist, those projects that were already in the hopper complete, it's hard to say exactly what our sales tax for 21, 22 is going to look like. And then with the effects of COVID um, on all of our other retail businesses, there's a very good chance that we're going to see a reduction, which is why when we budgeted for 2021, we did budget for a 10% reduction in our sales tax revenue. So we did budget for that uh, for a recession with a, um, I think a modest increase back in 2022. So a 5% increase on top of that 10% decrease. So that wouldn't get us necessarily back to 2020 levels, but kind of a slow or not, I don't wanna say 2020 levels, our original budgeted 2020 levels, not necessarily what we performed. So um, yeah, we've definitely been taking those sales tax into consideration. There's so many moving pieces right now. Well, there's been so many moving pieces to the sales tax piece since COVID hit, but of course we continue to have those moving pieces and just trying to pull the layers off and seeing which sectors are having what kind of impacts and what do we think that's going to mean for the future. So yes, we have taken that into effect as well. Good, thank you very much. So a quick, just a quick uh, overview of our capital projects um, since this will be one of the ordinances that you'll also be adopting um, on, the, on the 16th um, is our capital projects. Um, this is a pie chart of the $73.7 million in capital projects over the biennium. This is a mixture of general fund capital as well as our proprietary fund capital. 
And even though they're small, I did asterisk the, the general fund type projects. So the general fund supported that is transportation and streets, parks, arts and recreation, and then the general municipal government. So that makes, a, a, well, I should have done the math beforehand, but that makes it 40% of the total, the total pie of that $73.7 million. And those projects, those general government projects are primarily funded through impact fees, real estate excise tax and grants. Um, the most significant chunk of those general government projects are our street projects. And I have the, the significant street projects highlighted on the right. And then all of the other projects are all of, are mostly utilities, our utility projects, um, water um, and sewer projects. There are um, There is a municipal parks project in there, the Jacobson Tree Farm, as well as um, the, the hangar facility construction project from the airport fund. But for the most part, all of those non-governmental, and the Jacobson Tree Farm, I misspoke, is actually a, is a general fund um, project. It is not that would be in the parks, arts, and recreation slice of the pie. It is not a utility project, but all the other projects on that list are proprietary fund projects. And most all of those projects are funded either through um, fund balance, um, which have been established through rates. So when we're establishing user rates, we build in capital projects, um, future capital projects into those rates. So that money, that additional money goes into fund balance. So we're using that um, accumulation of fund balance as well as bond issuances. So we have um, several large water fund projects and you guys may recall um, late this spring, early summer, um, our first bond issue this year was um, a revenue bond, which had two pieces. There was a refunding piece to that bond as well as a new issue, new bond issue to cover and fund um, new water utility projects. And so with that, our next steps um, will be um, will be next week. We'll just have the public hearings. Um, there won't be a, a presentation associated with that. That will just be a public hearing really based on my presentation from tonight. And then um, as long as there's no changes, we will be preparing the final ordinances for your review for the 11-9 study session. I don't plan a big presentation, but I will have an agenda bill that, that roadmaps really each of those pieces of legislation and what it means and how it's all related to the overall budget um, for eventual adoption, hopefully on November 16th. So with that, are there any questions? Any other questions for Director Thomas Council? Well, I don't think so, Jamie, so all great right. job. Okay, Excellent. thank you very much. Thank right. you. Okay. Uh, Council, this time I've got seven o'clock. I would like us to take a five minute recess and then reconvene at 7.05. So we will recess until 7.05.
Council Member Stearns, have you returned? Council Member Stearns, I do have a request in the Municipal Services discussion. If we could have item C moved up to item B and then item B moved down to item C. That, that, that sounds okay. Thank you. Just have okay. to oh, I'm sorry, okay. All right, uh, we'll call the meeting back to order. And at this time, we'll be doing the municipal services discussion items with council member Stern during that portion of the meeting. Oh, okay, great. I unmuted myself. So we're halfway there. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, so we've got four items um, up and uh, the first will be um, a year end report on our <clears throat> world renowned Auburn's farm and mar farmers market and how the market vendors and uh, customers all adapted to the COVID-19 pandemic. And I believe that will be handled by Daryl. Well, I will introduce it. Thank you, Councilman Stearns and the rest of you. Um, every year we do an annual end of the season update and I'm joined tonight by Amanda Valdez. She's our special events coordinator and oversees the market and Julie Kruger, arts and events manager who oversees Amanda and they just do a great job. And this was, as you mentioned, a very interesting year. We didn't know how it was gonna go. And it took a long time to be considered a grocery store, which farmers markets were in the end. And we had a really successful year um, with a lot of changes along the way that Amanda will walk us through here. Um, hopefully we can share a screen with a PowerPoint. And I appreciate a lot of the council that came out on these Sundays to either volunteer or to shop and to see what's going on out at Les Gulf Park, because um, we're really proud of our of our market and saddened with the loss of council member Pelosa and the energy that he did, but we're going to be recognizing him at the beginning of next season and we'll be keeping everybody informed of that as we go along um, in the off season here. So I'm going to turn it over to Amanda and I'm um, Julie. She knows the details as well. And um, I'll mute myself. Well, thanks Daryl. Um, so I'm Amanda Valdez from the Parks, Arts and Recreation Department as Daryl mentioned. And I will go ahead and share my screen so we can get this presentation done. Okay. Can you all see that okay? Okay, great. Um, so I'm excited to tell you, as Daryl mentioned, about the most adaptable season that I've experienced in my five years as the market coordinator. Um, this season, we operated for 16 weeks. We did close for one week because of the smoke from the wildfires. And so we added on a week to make up for that loss. Uh, tonight, I'll take you through all of the changes that we made this year and the impact that had on the overall market. So we'll dive right in here to the actual market site. Um, as you may notice, we utilized um, a different section of Lesco Park this year to accommodate public health requirements. In June, public health determined that we were in phase one, which meant we could only have farmers, flowers, food, health, and sanitation vendors. It wasn't until a couple weeks into July that we were able to bring crafters back. And unfortunately, we never made it to phase three this season. So we were not able to host our nonprofits and sponsors and other types of vendors that we would have had in a non-COVID year. You'll notice on our map here that we were acquired by King County Public Health to have a one-way flow of traffic and have only one entrance and exit into the market. So right off the bat, very different than what we're used to seeing um, when you come to any farmer's market. Um, it became very regulated for safety reasons. We had extra staff and volunteers to help maintain social distancing, again, required by King County Public Health. Uh, customers were asked to self-screen for COVID symptoms before entering the market. And thankfully we were all clear, no COVID cases on our end. And vendors were being screened by staff before entering the market each week. All of these things, brand new, never had to do them before. I worked closely with each vendor to create a safety plan tailored to them and their products. And I also submitted uh, weekly reports to King County Public Health on our progress, how it was going, how the social distancing was happening. Um, those eventually turned into monthly reports, which was great because we were doing a great job at keeping everyone safe. 
we unfortunately weren't allowed to do anything fun this year. All of our normal market activities, live entertainment, cooking demos, kids activities, animals, we weren't allowed to have any of that this year. Um, and I think everyone did a great job at adjusting to that. I know it was tough. Um, at first we weren't allowed to have dogs in the market and then we eventually public health uh, loosened the reins on that restriction. We were able to bring dogs back into the park and we were also limited on the number of people we could have inside the market. So previously you could come in and out, we could have a ton of people, packed them all in there. Um, we were limited to two people per booth per at, at any given time. Um, so we had uh, on average, we had between 30 and 40 vendors, which in theory meant we could only have 60 customers shopping in the market at a time. Um, when working with public health, they did loosen that the reins on that restriction for us because we did such a good job at social distancing and spreading out in the park. We are definitely a very safe place to be this summer. Here you'll see all of the new rules that were required and to enforce in order to remain open and safe by King County Public Health Standards. These images were used to communicate to the public in advance, as well as reminders on site. You'll see the customer health screening checklist there. Those were the questions that customers were being asked, as well as vendors. Um, you'll see the social distancing guidelines, as well as other modified rules to encourage safe distance shopping. Um, the mask requirement, social distancing, hand sanitizer, and just really making it an in and out, be safe, be prepared experience, which is very different. And here's those rules in place. So as I mentioned, I worked with each vendor on their safety plan and what their booth needed to look like to keep them and customers safe. So you'll see barriers, you'll see social distancing. We thankfully only had a line out the front just the first day when we were all just getting our bearings and figuring out how this is gonna work. Um, our monitored exit and exit is also shown there. Okay. So here we get into our customer counts. Again, we were limited on the number of customers we could allow inside the market at a time. Um, you know, this was back when COVID was first booming. And so there was also a large population at risk who was not coming to farmer's markets, who were not going outside, um, as may still be the case now. So our customer base definitely changed this year. And our market experience shifted with that from a fem fun family outing that you could bring the whole family to, um, to the park, to the farmer's market, to a plan ahead, in and out shopping experience. This year we saw roughly a 30% decrease in customer attendance. We didn't see as many family groups this year and again that at-risk population. We didn't see uh, the folks that previously came for the atmosphere because our atmosphere changed. So it, our customers changed with it. What's interesting is that although we saw a significant decrease in our customer attendance, our vendors still considered this a successful year financially. Here's a comparison from 2019 to 2020. These 12 farmers that you see here, um, I've compared them because they all attended um, all of the weeks from 2019 to 2020. So it's easier to compare those numbers to give you a good idea. And this is where the biggest sales are is our farmers. That's where people are spending the most money. So you can see that um, despite COVID and despite our decrease in customer count significantly, our farmers still did pretty well, only a couple of thousand dollars less. There's some exceptions here, which I can delve into if you'd like, um, but just lots of different factors going in there. Okay, so again, keeping in mind that we saw 30% less people, but that our vendors were doing pretty well. Here's the comparison of the overall sales um, due to COVID requirements. So we had to space out our vendors um, 10 feet. We learned a lot about sharper behavior this year, and we did see 40% less vendors and an overall 56% decrease in the vendor participation. Um, Overall, our vendors also made 24% less compared to 2019, but it is difficult to compare these stats because there are so many variables. Um, some vendors only come one time, some vendors, you know, their, their expectations of, of their sales are, are all different and vary across the board. The takeaway here is that we had half the amount of vendors who made just a little less compared to 2019. And if you talk to any one of our vendors, they will tell you that 
it was a great year for them. They had a great experience and overall they did pretty well. Here are the vendor sales by week, which is interesting to look at. You'll see that red line is our 2020. <clears throat> Normally we see vendor sales really start to drop come late August when other events are happening. The throughout fair gets going, kids go back to school and families gear up for fall and get ready for all of that. But because of COVID, those normal activities weren't an option this year. So folks opted to attend the market instead. And we definitely saw that with our numbers being more consistent and our sales being more consistent as the season went on. We didn't see a huge drop like we normally do. We did see an increase in our EDT and our SNAP market match. So these are our food assistance programs. Um, SNAP market match, if you're not familiar, it's a matching program if you have an EBT card. Um, we are a participating market and we're able to match those dollars um, up to a certain amount. So we saw an increase in those food assistance usage this year. This was largely due to the pan pandemic EBT relief funds that families and students received. Um, what we're seeing here is folks choosing to spend those additional dollars at the market instead of going to your grocery store. So it was nice to see, although it's disheartening to know that our community is really in need and needs those dollars, it was nice to see them spending them at the market, getting fresh fruits and vegetables straight from the farmer. And although we weren't able to have our regular crew of volunteers, we did get some new volunteers in. Um, who weren't in that high risk category, who were able to put in 127 volunteer hours this year. So we're very thankful for all of our volunteers that were able to help us out this year. And we also donated over 4,000 pounds of fresh produce to the Auburn Food Bank, which is really great. Um, the Auburn Food Bank will come every Sunday and pick up from our farmers and it goes right back into our community. And that's a quick wrap on the market this year. Um, I do feel like we can handle anything now that we've been through the ever-changing 2020 season. Um, so if you have any questions, happy to answer any of your questions. Um, otherwise, we'll see you next year in June of 2021. Wow, great. Thanks, Amanda. That's pretty cool. Um, uh, do, we, do we have any questions? If I were trying to raise your hand. All right. That's a yes. I think you're muted. Thank you, uh, Council Member Stern. I don't have a question. I just have a, a praise. It's awesome how well you guys all pulled together and very quickly uh, came up with a plan and how well the, the citizens you know, abide by it. And also it's nice to see that even though the COVID was active, they, the your vendors still got able, you know, were able to make a little bit of money. So congratulations on a, a great report. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely a community effort for sure. Council Member Brown, raise your hand. Great, Council Member Brown. Thank you, Councilman Stearns. Uh, I just uh, really want to uh, mention uh, our former colleague, uh, Bill Pelosa. And, you know, we have this because of his persistence and insistence and, and push. And then, you know, Amanda, for all the work that you've done and, uh, you know, your team to make this happen uh, is really, you know, a great thing for this city. And if it outlives the uh, COVID, it's gonna get better and better and better. It's going to get better anyway, but thank you very much for all your work. Thank you, Council Member. That's all I've got. Are there are no more questions. Any other questions? Um, I, I just have one quick one. It, so I think you said there are 40 vendors that participated. Where were, where, was that like 40 um, vendors who applied, or did we turn any away? or? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So um, the those that applied, we were only able to bring in those phase one and two vendors at first. So I want to say around 60 vendors applied, but we were only able to accommodate 40 of those vendors into the market this year. Oh, okay. okay. And then you said June 6th is when we're 
expecting to reopen. Yep, and June 6, 2021. That, that's a normal time for us? Yes, it's the first Sunday in June. Oh, okay, cool. All right, well, if I ever decide to eat vegetables, I'm right there. <laughs> you know where to find them. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> the potato is a vegetable, right? <laughs> okay. Oh, friend, love them. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Really thank appreciate you. all the great work and uh, all the great information. <laughs> <clears throat> so I believe that means we're on to our next item, which I think is the, um, we, we switched B and C. So that would be the police accountability update um, with Chief O'Neill. And um, I'm looking forward to this. We have a special focus on the membership and the role of the new police advisory committee, and also a, a more of an overview on the Valley Investigations team. So with that, I turn it over to uh, the chief. Um, so I am Mark Callier, I'm the assistant chief. Chief O'Neill had a family emergency that, and he could not be here tonight. Okay. Um, so I will go over uh, his presentation for you the best I can. Thank if you, you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to ask them as we go along. Get my screen shared here. Okay, everybody see that all right? Okay, so this is a police accountability and what we're gonna do is kind of just go over um, how the Auburn Police Department is, um, the accountability functions within the department that we're using right now and how uh, there's other agencies and other portions of the city that already um, kind of double check what we're doing. Uh, and so when we look at oversight systems, there's three kind of models that are out there One's an investigative focused model, one's a review focused model, and one's an auditor or a monitor type model. So when we look at uh, an investigative focused model, it's kind of uh, uh, those routine or independent investigations of the complaints against police officers. Um, to have somebody check kind of our processes uh, during an internal affairs investigation as an example. And so what we utilize right now is our HR department. When we, uh, go through an internal affairs process. Our HR department is kind of working hand in hand with us to make sure we're uh, following our contracts um, with the uh, associated um, guilds or unions um, and that our, uh, the discipline process is fair. Um, we're also checked by um, attorneys from WCI, the Washington Cities Insurance Authority uh, during those investigations to make sure that we're consistent. Uh, if discipline is handed out, that we're consistent with uh, current case law and that what we're doing is something um, if it involves some type of discipline or termination that uh, it can be supported. And so when you look at the review focused model, uh, it's, you know, those comments um, are on uh, completed investigation. So it, everything's kind of after the fact and, re and we're being reviewed for kind of the quality of investigations or procedures that we, we have in the department. Um, and so this is where the, the police advisory committee would kind of fall under this model. And so currently under this model, we have, uh, again, our human resources that checks us, uh, WCI checks us. Uh, we are checked by the criminal justice training commission, um, for discipline process is, is if something affects an officer's certification, uh, whether it meets disqualifying conduct or at any time an officer leaves service, we're required to notify the CJTC of that. Uh, to make sure that there's um, no reason that uh, an officer um, would need to be decertified and they, you know, if, if they leave prior to retirement age, things like that. And also the, uh, the police advisory committee, um, uh, when they're set up, they're going to be briefed on these completed internals to see if there's uh, a better process or maybe something that we didn't look at during the process that uh, we could use in a future um, investigation. And then the, uh, the auditor monitor model right now is those that are focused on kind of the broad pattern uh, complaint investigations. And those are the ones you hear 
um, from the uh, um, that Seattle has gone through the consent decrees, uh, Seattle, um, Chicago, Baltimore, um, where somebody else is coming in and basically monitoring them for them. So we already have, um, it's not mandated obviously, but we still have those systems in, in place. Again, with uh, HR, WCIA, we also use Lexapol for our policies, and I'll go into that a little bit uh, later. Um, that's really based on national best practices, current case law, uh, and state law um, within the state. And then we're also a, a state accredited agency through the Washington Association of Sheriffs and Police Chiefs. And so there are certain standards that we have to have within our policy and procedures within the department um, to maintain those standards so that we can maintain our accreditation. We've just recently gone through our accreditation process, uh, which, which we passed, so we'll be getting our accreditation certificate uh, later this year at the, uh, well, it's uh, gonna be a, a Zoom or an online conference this year due to COVID, but we will uh, be getting our certification. It's usually a, a, a two-year process before you have to recertify again. And, and But during that time period, we do have an accreditation officer that's making sure we're maintaining all those standards so that we're not uh, trying to catch up at the last minute. Throughout, throughout the whole time of our accreditation, we're still maintaining all those standards. Sorry, so right now, um, who has oversight and why? So based on some studies out there, there are only about 200, 200 agencies in the United States with some form of oversight um, out of uh, almost 18,000 law enforcement agencies in the state. So, or in the United States, so only about 0.11% have some type of oversight, whether it's federal oversight or uh, uh, you know, a city agency that, that does that themselves. So most programs are established in response right now to concerns expressed in the community about police accountability, whether it's um, you know numerous officer-involved shootings, whether it's some sort of uh, corruption within the agency, uh, things like that. And that's that's when the auditor monitor. It's that kind of sustained problems within an agency that will force, um, not force, I should say. That's wrong terminology, but it will generate where you know the cities and councils and the public will pass laws that mandate these these oversight committees. So out of the 260 law enforcement agencies right now in the state of Washington, there's only three uh, that have some form of formal oversight, which is the city of Spokane, the city of Seattle, which has the federal oversight, and King County has their own uh, police accountability program. So right now, the accountability in Auburn, what it looks like, so we continue to build accountability through uh, our leadership team and all the training that we go through as an agency. Um, the policies that we have in place uh, with Lexapol that I'll talk about in a minute, our accreditation, our relationship with WCIA, which is our risk management, the Criminal Justice Training Commission, our own human resources, the input we get both from the mayor's office and council input, um, the upcoming police advisory committee, um, the Valley independent investigation team is uh, the team that uh, focuses on officer involved shootings or uh, death in police custody, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And then uh, we're making a looking at making a change to our use of force committee um, and how we look at our use of forces within the department as far as the, um, the process that we go through to make sure that our forces um, used was adequate, that it's under, um, it's what's being trained and what's uh, allowable under the law. So I'll talk about that in a little bit. So in regards to our policies, um, we are, we contract with a company called Lexapol. It's based out of California. Um, and currently they serve over 8,100 police agent or police and government agencies in the United States. Um, they are kind of a custom they're customized to your department and to the state you work in. So there's 170 state specific policies that are written um, by the, the professionals that work for Lexapol to make sure that they are still meeting state standards, um, changes in state legislation and kind of best practices within the state. They also provide uh, updates in our policy based on um, case law from the Ninth Circuit, which is uh, which Washington is 
part of, and also if there's any Supreme Court decisions that come down uh, that will affect uh, police practice or procedures. So one of their services that uh, we utilize quite a bit is they provide kind of a daily training bulletin about policies. Um, and we do three training bulletins a week. And so what that does, it's like, uh, it's based on all of our current policy. It's kind of a, it runs through basically what the policy says, um, kind of a scenario based um, incident. And then it asks the officer to answer a question based on the scenario and what our policy is um, so that the officer you know, it, it helps them memorize and, and retain what our policies are. And so that we know that, yeah, they are, they're confident and that they understand what the policy means and, and what it says. So the good, the good portion about Lexapol is that it's uh, on electronic platforms. So we get them through our uh, cell phone app and our computers 24 hours a day. Um, so we don't have to worry about uh, graveyard officers only being able to be trained during daylight hours so they can go through these these training bulletins um, during their normal shift if they need to. So we uh, an additional program that's involved with Lexapol um, is that it helps our accreditation manager there's specific policies that that move right over to Lexapol so that we know our policy meets the state accreditation standard through WASPIC. And then uh, if we uh, need to change a policy because they are uh, state and agency specific, uh, we can modify those um, as we see fit. Uh, those are reviewed and supported by both our city attorney's office and WCI when we are looking at making a, um, a change um, to any type of specific policy. So we have those reviewed as well to make sure that they are still meeting industry standard, but they are more conforming to what we do here in Auburn. Um, so, you know, any new policy that's not in Lexapol um, or any change from the recommended policy is reviewed by the city attorney and WCIB for implementation. And we can also put those uh, into Lexapol and add it to our policy manual um, without that affecting all the over, you know, the other 8,100 agencies that use Lexapol. And so, uh, Chief Anil indicated one of the examples we have, it's called a wrap. It is a um, new tool that we have for kind of uh, combative uh, people that were taken into custody. And it, it basically is a something that uh, limits movement and restricts movement in their legs, but it's not something that we have in policy already. Uh, and so it's not widely used. It's kind of a new uh, device that's come out. And so we would go through the whole uh, policy process and then have that reviewed by a city attorney to make sure that yes, it's, it's within the, uh, best practices that it meets uh, certain uh, legal requirements and things like that before we actually implement that policy. Council Member Trotman, you also raised your hand. Yes, I was. Yes, I was wondering on, uh, you said that your officers have uh, training on the left of pole. And uh, who, who keeps track of their training? And uh, how do you know which ones took those trainees? Uh, do, you, do they go by certificates and, or how do you measure that? So specific to Lexapol itself, the program itself um, will print out a spreadsheet and notify us if you know, officers are falling behind. It gives us basically how many trainings they need to do to catch up. And so we have uh, printouts that our training officer can go through. And then we send notices out to the sergeants and commanders to say, you know, these officers are behind in their, in their policy. Um, their, uh, we call them DTBs, the daily, daily training bulletins. And so it, it'll also give out, if we push out a policy update or a new policy, um, the program keeps track of who has signed off on it. And so um, if, you know, we usually give them about a two week window to make sure, you know, unless it's a, a highly Im important update, we usually give them about a two week window. So we hit both sides of our, our work staff to make sure they sign off on the policy. And if, after that time, then we start uh, letting the sergeants know, hey, at the beginning of their shift, they need to go in and, and review this policy and make sure they understand it and sign off on it. Okay, thank you. You answered my question about how long a time frame you gave them. So. Thank you for the update. You're welcome. Um, so, oh, okay. 
so since January 1st of this year, um, we have been revising our internal investigations and employee discipline policies. Um, this is an ongoing process. And so right now um, we, we have a, um, it's a, because it's such an in-depth policy, it's taken a couple months for the command staff to go over proposed changes. Um, we've having it reviewed by our human resource department. And then uh, our next steps on that is uh, taking it to our employees. We've had uh, the initial review with our employees. Um, and so because it could affect some working conditions, they have to take it back to their unions to make sure the changes aren't gonna impact um, uh, their bargaining or, or their contracts. And so we're really trying to make a change to make it more streamlined, uh, easier to understand, and to um, really put in place some, some of the, the information that's coming out as far as potential changes um, in the state law that's coming out. So under our accreditation, like I said before, we are accredited agency through the Washington Association of Sheriff and Police Chiefs. They are a state agency. Um, we used to uh, be accredited under CALEA. Some, some of you may have heard of that as the Commission on the Accreditation of Law Enforcement Agencies. That is a national accreditation. Uh, the problem with that and why we moved away with, with from that is the cost of reaccrediting every year was becoming um, kind of more than uh, uh, the department was looking at. And then the state uh, WASPIC moved their accreditation standards almost to mirror um, what CALEA was doing and really bring it more to uh, Washington state standards and, and the West Coast. A lot of the stuff through CALEA, um, we would bring in assessors from outside the state. You know, the, the CALEA itself, they would fly people in from, you know, South Carolina or some other areas where, you know, with the West Coast has historically been on the forefront of police work and kind of uh, uh, accountability and law changes. And, and so some of the standards that they would look at um, were standards that they didn't follow their own agency. And so we moved away from CALEA several years ago and just uh, stayed with WASPIC um, because it was more, I guess, personalized uh, to Auburn since we are in Washington state. So, um, but what the accreditation does is, is it professionalizes uh, the industry itself, meaning law enforcement. And so it provides that review process for agencies um, to be certified that we are operating under the best practices of our industry, um, under the best practices within the state of Washington, that we're following all the changes in, in case law uh, and things like that. So, you know, we have to have those practices in place to show that, you know, we, we know what we're doing to make sure the public has trust that, that we are following the law. Um, and so right now, um, and I think there's more to come, but right now there's 150 standards under the WASPIC accreditation that are mandatory for every agency within the state um, that they come out and review. And they will, when they come out and do their reviews, they will, they don't look at 150 standards. They don't tell us really what standards in advance they're gonna look at. They will randomly uh, pick certain standards and make sure that we are in compliance with them. So it's a, it's a time consuming process. It's a difficult process to go through and not every agency uh, re-accredits or um, passes their accreditation, but Auburn has been very successful and we've gotten, uh, I don't wanna say glowing reviews, but I'll say glowing reviews from the state um, when they come and do our accreditation process. And so, what these on-site on assessors will do, this year was a little bit different because we had to send them our files of every uh, policy they wanted to look at or in practice. And so, but usually when it's on-site, they'll come out, like I said, and review uh, every file we have on what they're looking for to make sure we have documentation to show that we're uh, maintaining that standards and, and how we prove that standard, whether it's through certain arrest reports, through certain, um, notifications that we make to, let's say, if we uh, arrest a foreign national, there's certain requirements to notify the foreign consul, and we have to document that we did so. So they'll look at kind of those type of um, standards and to make sure that we have documented uh, cases that we actually prove that we are following that standards. So, and then what what they do as well is, is to give us areas that, that we may need to improve on or 
maybe something that will help us um, follow or model that standard a little bit better. And so it'll give us back their feedback and kind of lets us go through a self-assessment on areas that we need to improve on. Because even though we kind of pass accreditation, you know, there's always room for improvement on what we do or how we uh, are maintaining our standards. So um, it's a good thing for us. And so what we what it helps on is it, it helps with our recruitment because that's uh, when people are looking to join an agency or transfer to an agency, they look at agencies that that have these policies in place that that are standardized where they're not going into um, some agency that kind of makes up their own rules as they go. And so um, and it shows that our processes are fair and um, equitable across the board. that something is that okay um so these are just some of the things that uh when we look at accreditation that uh, they will look at um, whether we have uh, our goals and objectives for our agency what our role and authority is you know we have to have that shown in our policy manual our use of force policies um records management uh, various things like that. If you have any questions on any specific topic, I'll be happy to answer those. I don't need to read off everything that's on your screen, um, but that's kind of a uh, things that they will look at. Um, and we like to, you know, look at the, the big ones, the liability ones is really, really look at, which is use of force, pursuits, uh, things of that nature. And again, for risk management, we utilize the city utilizes the Washington City's Insurance Authority. Um, so they do, in addition to kind of helping us with our internals and making sure, you know, for disciplining somebody that it can be supported, they do provide training to supervisors and officers to help reduce reduce any liability. Um, they do provide legal opinions to us in the city uh, related to our training and policies. Um, they advise us on our collective bargaining. And they do help with the uh, the oversight related to internal investigations, employee discipline, and, and misconduct that you know does occur within our agency. And so um, we rely on them uh, as a city and an agency quite a bit for that. They also evaluate any claims that are based on police misconduct, incidents, and operations that may arise that might involve some sort of either property damage or property loss. And so they'll provide us that that feedback that's important on how in the future uh, we might be able to better um, uh, reduce any any risk or anything like that to the the city and the agency. So and then the Criminal Justice Training Commission itself. So they set the standards for the uh, in service training that we go through. There's a certain amount that we're required to do every year, uh, each officer. Um, and as well as a, uh, a crisis intervention training mandated by law that each officer is required to go through, uh, including up to and including the chief. And so every year we have to provide a certification to the, the training commission that every officer has attended, you know, so many hours they've attended these, the required intervention training. We have to provide that to the state and they will let us know, you know, if we have one person that might be out of compliance because there's, very little room for um, reason why somebody won't be in compliance. And so they also certify our trainers within the agency, our defensive tactics trainers, our, our firearms instructors, our, our EVOC, which is our vehicle emergency vehicle operations uh, instructors. So they provide certification for all those instructors so that we know we are uh, using best practices and um, doing exactly what the state uh, says we should be doing. So uh, you may not know, but there is a certification process for all officers. I believe that went into place around 2004-ish. And, and then the decertification process for officers uh, with founded disqualifying misconduct, which is outlined in state law. And so anytime an officer separates employment with, with our agency and with the city, uh, regardless of the circumstances, whether they retire, whether they move to another agency, um, or they just want are getting out of law enforcement altogether, we're required to send notice to the state. And then we have to indicate whether they uh, resign kind of, uh, or they left 
in lieu of some type of discipline that may result resulted in some sort of disqualifying misconduct. And that disqualifying misconduct is uh, such things as um, committed a felony, um, dis, you know, dishonesty, they're dishonest during investigation, uh, things of that nature. And so the upcoming change or ongoing change right now with uh, initiative 940, uh, the law enforcement training and community safety act. So one of the things that we are required to do is we have to put uh, our instructors go through a patrol tactics instructors course. Um, we're currently looking at putting eight officers through there. We are limited right now because of COVID. Uh, the state has really limited the number of uh, classes they've been able to put on. And so they are um, extending that requirement uh, into next year to get those officers trained. And then once they are trained, they're allowed to uh, they become trainers for our agency. And so then every officer within the agency will be required to go through that course and be trained by our own uh, certified trainers. Okay, with uh, human resources, like I said before, they um, oversee all of our internal investigations. So they are um, working hand in hand with our internal affairs um, investigator uh, from the get-go to make sure that we are uh, following our procedures properly, that we're not going to do something that may violate a contractual issue or something of that nature. Uh, they kind of um, are there as an observer for the most part, so they will observe all interviews we have. Once we have a finding, a lot of times they will sit in on the review board uh, and give input if needed as far as you know, did we think about this policy or, you know, things of that nature. So they, they offer input as needed. Um, they, I wouldn't say they approve our discipline, but they and WCA will ultimately help us defend our discipline process if it's something that involves time loss or termination. And so they review basically the, the discipline that will be handed out to officers uh, to make sure that it's, that it's defendable. And so we we will consult with uh, both the city and the WCIA labor attorneys prior to actually dispensing the discipline to make sure that um, what we determine uh, will be the outcome is something that we can enforce and it won't get overturned during the labor process. And so, the good part about that, and I think uh, we've been very successful with that, is we haven't had any disciplined overturn or taken to arbitration in the last 20 years that either the chief or I are aware of. It's gone through the discipline process, but nothing has been taken to arbitration uh, since I've been here. I, and I've been here since 1994. I don't remember anything since 94 that's been taken to arbitration. So it's been a long time. So that's good. I mean, it's... Uh, we work well with uh, human resources um, to investigate these alle allegations and to make sure that um, if there's misconduct, to make sure that it's any discipline is handled fairly and appropriate. And then as kind of another oversight, we have uh, the elected officials here. Um, anytime there's a question, uh, anybody has direct access to the PD, whether it be Chief O'Neill or myself, to ask questions about a process. We are fairly open with what we can be open with, unless it's uh, something uh, that's in process, like in an investigation where it might compromise an investigation. Um, you know, we will answer questions as much as we can. And then we're always open to any suggestions, you know, that, that come from the mayor or the council as far as ways we can improve. And so the next thing uh, we're gonna move to is the police advisory committee. So also here is uh, Commander Christian Adams and Pastor um, LaShawn Lambert. They work directly with uh, Chief O'Neill and uh, the primary uh, organizers in both setting up the police advisory committee and selecting the members. So I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Commander Adams. Apologize, I'm trying to get on mute here. Oh, 
Are we having some technical difficulty? Council, we're having a few technical challenges for a moment. We'll be right back uh, once we can get Commander Adam's screen sharing working. Oh, in the interim, I just wanted to thank the assistant chief. That was um, quite a ex really detailed report. Hello. Oops, hi. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Good. <clears throat> okay, so Pastor Lambert and myself, we uh, had a chance encounter to meet he came to our police department to talk about how we could have better relationships with the community and the police department. Uh, that was about a 15 minute conversation that turned into a three hour conversation. And we both agreed that we needed to come up with something uh, to get the community involved. And that's when the police advisory committee, also known as the PAC, uh, was born. Uh, like it says in the slides, it provides uh, the community with the opportunity to act in an advisory role. It will assist in setting department priorities for community policing through review of community uh, policy uh, materials, assessment of the effectiveness of the strategies and recommendations for improvement. Uh, we will solicit feedback. We will uh, review and make recommendations on the decision-making process. They'll assist on uh, prioritizing police programs. Uh, they will serve as an active community member and provide uh, advocacy in the community for the work of the community and the community relations between the uh, PD and the Auburn residents. Uh, we will have public, we will have meetings with this group and they will not be provided access to investigative materials, but they will um, get some information to help us make better decisions. Next slide. So the chief will have the uh, option of supplementing this membership as needed. And he obviously will be a member. Uh, the committee will consist of the following people listed on the screen. Uh, we looked for represent representatives from each and every demographic we could think of. Uh, obviously we were not perfect with everything, but we thought outside the box. Um, Pastor Lambert was very instrumental in helping me uh, come up with those members of our uh, Auburn city people that could serve on our board and help uh, with the voice in our uh, police advisory committee. One more. Next slide, please. And then the uh, members were selected by myself, Pastor Lambert who's sitting over here with me and uh, Chief O'Neill. Uh, it gives us a layer between the police department and elected officials. Um, the improvements suggested by the PAC will be implemented and approved through our legal HR and the other uh, channels we use for best practices. And then the police chief and the command staff are responsible for the operation of the police department while being advised by the PAC. Uh, council appointments decrease the effectiveness of the current structure as we have people of all walks of life and all kinds of experiences that we have selected for this uh, opportunity. Uh, just say, yep, there you go. Any questions? Um, do we have any questions? I can't even hear. Um, I, I have a, a one, which is um, in, in terms of the membership, do, do you anticipate having anyone from the Muckleshoot tribe? Yes, we, we asked them to send us a recommendation, which they have. Okay, um, great, thank you. No, any thank you. Anyone else with questions? Councilmember uh, Trout Manuel raised her hand. Oh, Council Member Trout Manuel. Yes, I did. I didn't hear how many uh, applicants you have selected, and have you closed the applications? Uh, we have not officially closed it, as we have a couple groups that we have no representation for, and we have actively been uh, hoping to find someone that would apply for those. We had 108 people uh, apply, and we selected 24. 
Okay, yeah, because I had uh, several Latinos um, uh, call me and ask me if they could uh, still apply because they said they tried getting on and um, they said they weren't accepting any applications. So I told them we were going to talk about it tonight. So I was going to ask the question. So if you're still open to accept the applications, then I'll ask them to apply. We, we are accepting for certain groups that we did not get any representation for. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Any, any other questions? Pastor, did you want to speak? Is the pastor going to speak? We'd love him. Council members, again, having uh, several people in council chambers with their uh, surfaces tonight and the muting and unmuting and volume up on my computer, volume down when uh, one of them is speaking. If you will provide us with the grace that you have been providing, we would appreciate it as we get these things worked out. Uh, Yay. Well, this is Pastor LaShawn Lambert, and I want to thank uh, the mayor, assistant mayor, and the rest of council for allowing me an opportunity to share when he's not on the screen. When George Floyd uh, we lost audio. Council, again, uh, if you will just provide us with a couple moments of grace here as we are changing out electronics. Are there any questions for Commander Adam while we're doing this? Okay, there you go. Okay. I guess we're good. I, I, I can't hear you, Pastor. So it's because of oh, you really have to be. Oh, I, I okay. Well, yeah, wow, that feel all high tech now. Our church actually has a pipe organ, so this is really high tech. I'll try it again. I'm Pastor LaShun Lambert. I pastor Resurrection Church Auburn uh, here in downtown Auburn. And when we had our first conversation, it was pretty close after George Floyd and the protests had kicked off. And after emailing and talking with the mayor and some of the council members, it was determined that we could have a relationship in Auburn that was different than the relationship that Seattle has with law enforcement and with people of color. And so I applaud your efforts and you allowing us to have conversations before we start trying to fix problems because we don't actually know all the problems yet because we haven't had discussions for years. Uh, I, I went to Kentwood High School and I knew uh, about dusk dark, it was time to get out of Auburn and stay away from Black Diamond and Four Corners is a place you need to make sure your friends get dropped off. I believe we can change that when we start seeing people as human beings. When you look, up, look at the makeup of the PAC or the Police Advisory Committee, you will see there are people that you would not expect me to be sitting down discussing law enforcement with because our perspectives are so different. That was the reason they were selected for the committee. There are people I'm sure we're gonna to have to sit and learn how to be friends. But for Auburn to be a safe place for me and my family and you and yours, we're gonna to have to become a family. Now, this is not the end result. Like we're not gonna get up and take pictures after the meeting and say, yay, we did something because the day for that is over. That died in the 90s. In our current generation, we're gonna to have to have real change. We're just gonna to have to have real conversations and coming from a Christian tradition, the idea of repentance, which doesn't mean saying you're sorry. It means doing something different. I believe that the PAC is a tool that will help us at least get information on the table so that we can address it. 
And if ever there's a challenge with the, the strengths or the weaknesses of the pack, that's why we have wonderful people like you and the mayor that will help lead our city to a place of safety. Uh, in my neighborhood, there are many people that are concerned about the Proud Boys and other folks running around with shotguns because they don't feel safe. What we need to do is find out what's really going on in our city. And though you do a wonderful job of representation, it's gonna require more voices being more and more honest. I expect the first meeting to be like the first week of marriage counseling, because I spent the last 25 years as a marriage counselor and a family counselor, where people tell you what they think they need to say. But over time, we'll be able to discover what's really in the heart of our brothers and sisters in Auburn and come to conclusions, like the question about tribal members. I want my Muckleshoot brothers and sisters to feel just as safe as anyone else in our city, where there is a common standard or a common belief that the police represent us all and will keep us all safe. That driving around town when I see an officer come up and I don't see Christian Adams or the assistant chief or the chief behind me, I don't have that, oh my God, I don't wanna die. Because my experience, I have several members of my family who are in law enforcement and I have others that have been killed by law enforcement. So understanding how, well, the fears and concerns of a black man, I, I promise you, I understand what it's like to be a black man in America right now but also understand what it's like to have my cousins explain to me what it's like to be feared when they're just out there to serve and protect. So my hope and my desire is that as we move forward, we'll be able to create an Auburn where my grandbabies will feel much safer than I and my children feel today. But I thank you for your time and for allowing me a moment to speak to you. Thank you, thank you, Pastor. Really appreciate those words and um, the spirit and place from where they come from. And uh, look forward to being how this, uh, how this grows and evolves and, and makes our city a safer and uh, better place. Um, so I'm not sure who's going next, but I think we're going to Valley oh, investigate. Uh, Council Member Stearns, it looks like Council Member Brown and Council Member Jayraj all uh, both have their hands up for questions. Oh, oh, okay, please, um, Council Member Brown. Uh, thank you, uh, Council Member Stearns. I uh, really appreciate the uh, presentation tonight and the pastor for his work in our community. Uh, it's very laudable. Uh, I have a question for Commander Adams. Uh, and you might have mentioned it or someone might have, but uh, on the uh, pack, I'm curious, do we have um, LGBTQ uh, participation and is there religious uh, diversity on the, on the pack as well? Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Uh, that is one of the groups that we have not received applications for. And so we are still leaving it open, actively trying to find someone to fit that role on our group. And I'm sorry, what was the second part of your question? Uh, the religious uh, diversity uh, that uh, you know might reflect the broader community. Yes, we do. We do have representation from the various faith-based groups in our community. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Council Member Jay Raj. Thank you, um, Council Member Stearns. Um, Commander Adams, um, that you said one of them was one of the uh, representation that's missing was the LGBTQ. What was the other one? I'm sorry. I think that is the only group we are missing, sir. Oh, so you only have one then? I believe so. Okay, that's that's what I needed to know. No, thank um, you. I've been kind of trying to scour to see if I can I could find the LGBTQ, but uh, so far I've been coming empty-handed on that. I got faith in you. <laughs> thank you very much. Yes, uh, we all do. <laughs> thank you, Councilmember J. Raj. Okay, are there any more questions? And, and uh, thank you, Mayor, for flagging that. I, I didn't see this. 
um, if we don't have any more questions, and I guess now we can um, move on to the Valley Investigation Team. So I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the the Valley Independent Investigation Team. Was it a uh, a change we made um, this year uh, to better reflect that it is an independent independent uh, team uh, under uh, and meets the requirements of Initiative 940. So the measure itself under 940 um, requires law enforcement to receive violence, de-escalation, mental health, and first aid training, um, and changes the standards for the use of deadly force, adding the good faith standard and an independent investigation. And so, you know, um, without going over 940 in detail, um, it is designed to ensure that an object investigation following any uh, use of deadly force by a law enforcement officer or uh, a death basically in police custody uh, is thoroughly and objectively investigated. So what it what it does is, is the the agency involved in the incident, meaning uh, if an officer is involved in a shooting resulting in a death, the agency that the officer works for cannot be part of the investigation team. So with VIT itself, uh, it's been around uh, since 2012 when it was the Valley Independent Investigation Team. Prior to 2012, if we had a um, in, cu in custody or an officer involved shooting here in Auburn, we would select uh, maybe Kent, if uh, they weren't too tied up with things, we would have had Kent coming down uh, to Auburn to investigate that. But with the increase in population, the number of police contacts, um, it kind of became a burden for one agency to provide those investigations. So it was decided in 2012 to split that and form a regional team um, with the Valley agencies right now, almost based on our uh, SWAT model that we use for the Valley SWAT. And so those agencies that were involved in Valley SWAT all signed up to be part of the independent investigation team. And so what, what happens is anytime um, we have those uh, officer involved shootings or something where an officer involved resulting in the death or serious bodily injury um, of a subject, we will make a call uh, and we route that through uh, the, the investigation team uh, commander. There is an overall uh, commander for the team who is uh, and an administrative commander who is a deputy or assistant chief from one of the involved agencies. And then we have a, among the Valley chiefs, they also select a chief who kind of oversees all of Valley investigations, te independent investigation teams. And so there's a, that chain of command structure. So if if an agency, if so we have a officer involved incident here in Auburn, we would notify uh, currently um, assistant or deputy chief Drever in Tukwila is the acting commander. So we would notify chief Drever that, you know, we have this incident in Auburn, we'd like the Valley team to be called out. And so they would start making notifications. And so if the incident happened here in Auburn, or Auburn officers could not be part of that investigation at all. And so it, it conforms to the, the current standard where we're not involved in the investigation. Uh, and so it is truly independent, even though we are a member of the overall team, if something occurs involving Auburn, we would not be in part of any of the investigative process. And so some of the things that the, the team does is it will notify uh, the family member or if we can find one of the person whom deadly force or serious bodily injury was used on and they'll be notified as soon as practical by the involved agency or VIIT appointee. Um, VIIT will assign a member of the team as a family liaison within 24 hours of the incident uh, and report basically any new developments or case progression to that family representative. Uh, and also they are required. And so this meets the requirements of I-940. And they also give advance notice anytime they are going to give a, a press release, whether it's an update on the investigation, whether um, you know the investigation is kind of stalled or anytime there's a, a press release, they're required to notify the family representative um, before that goes out. 
So since 2012 itself, the Valley team has investigated 48 officer involved shootings and or deadly in custody deaths. Uh, we do utilize them uh, when we have an incident that occurs up at SCORE because it's a regional facility. And so uh, we will use them um, to maintain that independent investigation even with SCORE. It's not, uh, I don't believe it's specifically spelled out under 940, but we still wanna maintain uh, independence when investigating something up there. Um, and so right now when um, the VIT is activated, a non-law enforcement community representative will be selected by the VIT command staff from the appropriate roster um, provided by participating member agencies. So each city provides a number of uh, representatives to VIT and, and they form kind of a, um, a large number that the team can pull on. The, the desire is to have somebody that's a member of the, um, somebody who deadly force or serious bodily injury um, was the subject of uh, the desire and the intent of the law is to have somebody from that effective community be on the, uh, be the community representative. And, and sometimes the city itself will not have somebody that meets those criteria. So the team has a pool. So we might pull somebody from that may be a rep uh, representative from Renton, but they meet their criteria of the involved community. So we may use them for an incident that, that might happen down here in Auburn. And so we're required to select those representatives and notify them within 24 hours of an incident. And their involvement in the process is to provide that oversight and make sure that we're meeting the intent of the law as far as transparency and, and communication and credibility that's outlined in the WAC. Um, and so that's what we've strived to do. Um, and it's been an ongoing process since the first of the year. And one thing that, that I'd like to point out is that the original Valley investigation team um, was the model, one of the models I think they used too, that, that uh, when the CJTC designed their criteria and kind of the standard, the, v, the Valley investigation team was one of the, the teams that they used that was already doing things uh, correctly and met most the majority of the criteria that was in I-940. And so there wasn't a whole lot of modification we needed to do to the team. And so, um, you know, I like to think of Auburn and the other involved agencies as still being kind of on, on top of the process and, and doing things correctly. So on our um, representatives right now that we have selected, uh, it's not in the slide, but we do have four. Uh, we did reach out, um, we had two initially and we added two more to try and get uh, more of a representation of um, those people that may be more affected by uh, police use of force um, to go along with that. And that's our complement to the overall team. And so Auburn provides four, um, some agencies may provide two um, and so on. It, but it gives a, a large pool that if we have the incident here in Auburn that if we don't have an Auburn, Auburn representative that meets the, the criteria of that community that's affected, we can, we can pull from the larger team. And we've already used one of our uh, community representatives, even though we are not directly involved in the investigation. If you remember uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had a, a King County uh, deputy involved in a shooting here in town. And so uh, our city officers responded as initial backup. And so we were taken out of any of the investigative process and, and the Valley team took over, but they used one of our community representatives to um, kind of oversee that investigation. So um, it's nice that we're already utilizing it like I think it was intended. Um, obviously there's always room for improvement, but um, so far we're doing it uh, accurately. Well, that's kind of a brief overview of the team. If anybody has any questions. Can Harvey J. Rogers raise your hand? Uh, Council Member Jayarash. I think you're muted. How about now? Thank you, uh, Council Member Stearns. Deputy uh, Chief uh, Callier, I've got a question for you uh, on this V um, Valley uh, team. Um, 
say for instance, there was an incident here locally by one of our local uh, uh, police officers, then uh, we wouldn't be involved. None of our team members will be involved in this uh, investigation, right? That's correct. The uh, okay. That's yeah, the, basically we would involve more likely with the initial because our officers would be the first responders. Um, but once we turn the scene over to the independent investigation team, our role in that investigation is done. Now we might end up, um, there's still some discussion on if there was criminal activity on the part of the person whom the force was used on, um, whether our agency would be the one doing a concurrent investigation for the criminal portion on that, that's still being worked out and, and trying to get uh, direction on what the intent of the law was in that regard. Okay, thank you very much. That was the only question I had. Uh, thank you, council member. Do we have any other questions? Um, it appears not, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank you. Um, Assistant Chief for the presentation on the VIIT. Um, that was really, uh, yeah, I was really you know, curious just to learn more about it and, and uh, I, you know, to know that it already comports with I 940s is, uh, you know, it's good to know that since we don't have to reinvent the wheel or, you know, spend time we probably don't have time to spend. So I'm, I'm grateful to hear that. I had a question about uh, a portion of your presentation earlier, and it had to do with um, the role of HR. And, and so the question I had was, um, who, who in HR, and I guess, you, you know, my sense is that from an earlier discussion that we had with the chief, um, you know, internally within the police department, some of the decisions regarding discipline go up the chain of command. And I'm wondering on the civilian side, on the HR side, how far up do, do those decisions go? So we would have assistance, uh, usually from uh, Aaron Barber, he's the uh, deputy HR director and employee relations manager, I believe is his kind of combined title. But usually he will be the one uh, when he's available that will um, assist us the most. Um, director Martinson, uh, will also help us out. And usually they're involved to make sure that, that uh, number one, we are um, abiding by the contract, that there's not gonna be any issues or, or technical reasons that you know something could get overturned. Um, and they help us with that bridge with uh, WCIA to make sure that we're doing things correctly. Uh, within the agency, uh, under our policy, it's my position, the assistant chief position um, that has the, I won't say the final say, but uh, I hand out the initial discipline to the officers. And so I have to be able to support my decision and, and know that, that uh, my decision is supported by uh, current law and, and, and that I'm acting within the uh, scope of the contracts we have with the, the uh, other various unions within the department. So, um, you know, it's, it's a great help for my position to know that I have that support. Oh, good, thank you. Uh, and, and then just um, one other thing, you had mentioned the, um, you know, the changes and, and they would need to also um, be accepted or um, be included into the union contract. And I'm just wondering, wh when is the contract coming up again? Uh, I believe the contract expires at the end of 2021. So we'll start negotiations usually um, around October of uh, 2020. Uh, throughout the contract term, uh, sometimes we'll have various uh, issues that that need to be addressed, and so we'll we'll do um, uh, kind of a negotiation where we'll have a, a memorandum of understanding to address a specific issue during the the terms of the contract. So we don't have to go and renegotiate the entire contract, but there might be a little um, an addendum that's added on during the the life of the contract. Okay. And, and then how long is the contract usually for? Five years? It's, it's usually for three years. It can be longer or shorter. It, um, that's part of the negotiations on how long um, the length of the contract will be. Okay. All right. Thank you. Really appreciate that information. Um, 
Do we have any more questions? Um, if not, I think that is it. And, and thank you, Assistant Chief, for so, so stepping I didn't, in. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I do have, uh, I think, one more oh. quick portion, just kind oh, of good. where we're going with our use of force uh, committee. Right. So it's uh, just kind of a uh, uh, a change that we're looking at making uh, to our in our use of force policy. Again, it's um, because it can affect work conditions. We are working with the, the unions to make sure that um, it can be supported. So we're looking at uh, modifying our policy so that our supervisors respond to all use of forces in the field um, to start a, uh, what we would call a supervisor use of force investigation. Our officers right now are required to report um, in, in certain uh, online, not online forms, but uh, reporting forms that we have anytime they use force right now. Um, but we're looking at having supervisors with each use of force, they're notified that the supervisor will respond to the scene. So sometimes right now they don't unless there's injury involved. And so we're looking at uh, some modifications to that policy. We're looking at uh, some changes on the initial review of the use of force, um, utilizing our instructors and kind of more of our experts um, within our um, kind of sign off uh, chain that we use for when force is used to make sure that um, it's used, the force was appropriate and that we've trained on that specific thing. We're looking at adding kind of a monthly synopsis on use of force incidents with lessons learned and potential uh, those topics for training um, to be shared among officers and the use of force instructors. And that uh, eventually once the, the pack is up and running to kind of share those um, synopsis of, of our force used with the, the pack so that um, if people have questions kind of on what we are, have done or you know if they've heard of something kind of through the grapevine that has made the rumor that we can address it at the pack so it doesn't spread farther. So that's um, some slight modifications we're looking at at our use of form right now, use of force. Uh, uh, great. Okay, and so then that was, a, that was the last thing I had on this presentation, so. I jumped the gun. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I had a quick question on the use of force committee. Would, would that have, would, would that, uh, would those reviews done by the committee um, be used in any sort of disciplinary um, results? So where we're looking at inserting that is, is right now our, the way we route our use of force it goes up the chain from basically the officer who enters it, it goes to their supervisor, it goes to their division commander, and then ultimately to me uh, for re the, the final review, whether it's, um, and then once it gets to my level is when it's determined, okay, is there, are there issues that we need to address further? So we're looking at inserting that, that use of force committee um, probably at either at the commander level or the initial supervisor level to kind of get that first eyes on the, to determine whether or not it's, you know, does it appear on its face that force to fall within the officer's training, um, current policy regarding our force, current case law, to kind of get that um, f that look on it before it gets to my level as the chief. Because um, per our policy, I have the final, um, mostly final uh, say on whether it's an acceptable use of force. Obviously, if I have questions on it, um, on our policy, uh, I would take it to the chief and say, hey, we have issues with this. This more than likely should be a, either an inquiry or internal investigation based on the, you know, something that may arise in it. Um, but the majority of our, our force right now, I'm, I'm usually the final say on whether it's an acceptable use of force or not. So it's, it's inserting that before it gets to my level. So we have those experts that we've, um, as a department and as a city, have sent to this kind of uh, uh, enhanced training to give them that expertise both through the state and, and outside um, uh, force instructors. Deputy Mayor DeCourcy has raised his hand. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councilmember Stearns. Uh, just related to the last slide on conclusion where the question of what areas do we need increased accountability, um, I would recommend that we allow the PAC to uh, work in their formation and uh, come up with what they're going to be coming up with uh, in that process. I was very pleased. I participated in a meeting with Councilmember Jay Raj, Mayor Backus, 
uh, Chief O'Neill and uh, with Dr. Hitt, Director Hemmen and Pastor Lambert, where Pastor Lambert shared a number of uh, uh, personal incidents he had been involved with. And we had a great dialogue and discussion on this. I'm glad to see that he is the co-chair of, of the PAC. Right? I think I have uh, personally full confidence in him that he will be able to do some wonderful things in relation to building this committee and uh, helping guide this committee along. And I would like to see, um, naturally we would have hopefully periodic briefings uh, to the council in relation to the work of the PAC. But I think that uh, in relation to that increased accountability, uh, let's let the PAC do their job and uh, report back to us and uh, give them the time and the, uh, the, the uh, latitude to do what they need to do to uh, get this thing underway. Um, great, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, really good words, true. Um, do we have any other questions uh, or comments? Um, it looks like not. So with that, I'd, I'd like to thank the Assistant Chief again um, for his great presentation and thank the pastor for joining us and, and sharing his uh, words of uh, optimism and really appreciate uh, this discussion we've had. Um, so thank you both and thank council members and mayor for the questions. Okay, so that brings us to the third presentation, which is on traffic safety and uh, photo enforcement cameras. Yes. I believe Director Gaub is going to head back. Thank you. Um, so I'm actually just going to introduce it and have Cecile Malik, our transportation, our senior transportation planner, do the presentation. And then when we're done with that presentation, we've got several on the meeting tonight to help answer any questions that the council may have. Before I pass it over, though, there's just a reminder for council that this is a follow up conversation to the conversation that we had at the retreat in March, where we talked about the potential of bringing back photo enforcement. And this is to talk about what the next steps are. With that, Cecile. Good evening, council members, and thank you. Let me share my screen. So are you able to see my presentation? Perfect. All right, so before I get started, I just wanted to make a statement that when we go into our car and we drive it around, we take the responsibility to follow the rules of the roads. And these rules are set in place to keep all road users safe, including ourselves. And I think that we've all been on I-5 when there's nobody on the road and everybody is going 70 miles an hour, except when there is a police car on the side of the road and then everybody is going at the speed limit at 60 miles an hour. And so talking about this program is talking about how we can get people to be safe and to comply with the rules of the road for everybody's safety. And so it's with this in mind that I wanted to go over this presentation. We really want to keep everybody safe, the drivers, the pedestrians, the bicyclists, um, everybody on the road. So let's, with that in mind, we had a photo enforcement program in Auburn, which ran from 2006 to 2014, by the end of which we had uh, camera enforcement, photo enforcement at three intersections and within six school zones. In uh, November 2014, the council voted to um, discontinue the program after we had uh, considered a new vendor. And, uh, and the whole history was discussed uh, at the council retreat. So I'm not going to go into too many details on the past. So going, where do we go from where we are today? So per state law, Photo enforcement can be used at uh, stoplight violations, for stoplight violations, so um, that should be the running the red lights, 
to enforce the school zone speed limits uh, during school zone speed time, the really speed time, and at railroad crossing. Well, we're not considering railroad crossing right now. We're looking at the others. So a little bit of statistics. Currently in our police traffic unit, we have three officers. Really, we have two officers who do full-time traffic enforcement and one who does um, response to crashes and helps with the enforcement when available, which is not, not always. And last year in 2019, uh, uh, traffic unit officers issued about 2,500 traffic violations for the whole year, all violations in the whole city. So these officers have to enforce traffic in the whole city. I'm not going to read the statistics, it's in front of you, but it's a lot, it's a lot to cover. So just for school zones, on average, we issue about 274 infractions per year for all 24 school zones combined in the city. And I wanted you to see as a comparison, the 2019 report for Kent's school zone camera uh, infractions. There, there isn't one school zone going one direction that issued as little as we did for all 24 school zones in Auburn in one year. What that means is that there are many people who will speed in school zones, but they don't get caught, which means they get the feedback. I can keep speeding. Nobody is enforcing here. I'm not getting caught, so it's fine. Um, I put the total infractions for the six school zones in Cannes for 2019, and that was 13,983 infractions. I'm just going to go back really quick. For the whole city, for all infractions, well, we only issued 2,500 infractions in the whole city. And, and this is just for six school zones in our neighboring town, neighboring city. So some of the key issues, some of the challenges that we face is that speeding and running red lights is behavioral, it's a choice. People are driving and they are choosing to go faster than the speed limit. Or they are choosing to accelerate at the light just to make it through before the other cars come through. It's a choice. And, and signage and other traffic engineering effort is not able to address that behavior. And today we don't have enough officers to really make an impact on the enforcement level to change that behavior. So to, to give you an idea of what we're all responding to, because we're all in it together in the traffic engineering and in the police traffic unit. Public work staff have received so far 78 speeding complaints. And I don't know how many police has received, but that's what I tracked on, on our public work side so far. These speeding complaints are forwarded to police and they are asked if they can to go and monitor the areas to see if they can catch the reported speeding. In addition to that, uh, police officers have processed more than 700 reported crashes just this year. Um, I'm just going to stay here for a minute just to understand when there is a reported crash, if it's a property damage, a hit and run or an injury related crash, it will take the police officers between an hour and an hour 45 to process all the information or the documentation 
the investigation. When we have a fatality, it will take the officers 120 hours. So, so far this year, we've had eight fatalities, which, has, which is taking 960 hours to process. So that, that's a lot of time for police to manage enforcing the traffic, processing the crashes and the information, doing the documentation. Um, and I can't go into details because I'm not a police officer, but it's just to give you a little background of the impact and the amount of work that our officers have. So looking at photo enforcement in nearby cities, um, I don't know if I need to go into the details of the slide. I think it's self-explanatory, but the blue column on the chart shows the revenue generated by the infractions issued um, through the traffic photo enforcement programs. And the other column is the cost um, of the vendor. It doesn't take into consideration the cost of running the program internally. Um, but this, this shows that the vendor expenditures do not exceed the revenues. And different cities have different photo enforcement needs. So they have different number of cameras, a different number of intersections and school zones. So I thought that was a good comparison. Um, to give us an idea of what we could expect from a new photo enforcement program here in Auburn. Now, the benefits of photo enforcement is that it will free up officers who are out on the street to monitor more areas because some areas will already be monitored by the cameras, which is a plus. Uh, another benefit is that we can have safer roadways by reducing the number of violations. And at, uh, at red lights, uh, a big problem of people running the red lights is that they will create T-bone um, type crashes, which, which are often deadly or will cause very serious injuries. If you've met anyone that has survived the T-bone crash, they, they will probably have gone through some major surgeries and, and maybe have lifetime consequences from it. That's, that's what we want to reduce. We want to prevent as much as possible. And, and this program can do that. When people see the sign or they know that there is a camera and they will get caught if they drive through the red light, they will they will stop and they, they may cause a rear end collision, which will be much more minor than a T-bone collision at full speed, speeding through the light. Um, I, I don't have this um, data here on the screen, but also when you look at the car speeds versus a pedestrian, uh, if you were to look at our state's Target Zero website, they have some very good information. And they show that when, a when there's a pedestrian hit by a car going at 20 miles per hour, nine out of 10 pedestrians will survive. If the pedestrians are hit at a car going 40 miles an hour, only one out of 10 pedestrians may survive. So the car speeds hitting pedestrian is also a big concern. So I encourage you to look at that. If you'd like more information about the uh, studies by the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, I encourage you to visit their website and they have a lot of topics covered and they go into much more details than I am here about the, um, the data on, on the um, red lights, red light collision and photo enforcement at red lights. So a, a third benefit of photo enforcement is 
when the revenues exceed the cost of the program, which includes the vendors, the cost of the vendors, but also the cost of staff processing all these um, all these infractions and the court cost and any cost of anyone who is involved in administering the program. Sometimes there's extra funds. These are unreliable, but there are some there can be extra funds available in the end. And these funds could be used for additional traffic calming or road safety projects or additional police enforcement or meet other city needs. Um, and, and that would be something that could be decided later um, with council guidance. But that it could also positively benefit the city with um, more, more safety. So based on the research, the history and the needs, staff drafted a request for proposal for photo enforcement. And the options would include either the just school zones or school zones and red lights to be decided later. And we have key criteria, we have many, many criteria in the request for proposal that the vendors will need to meet. But some, some of the key criteria is that the program will need to operate at no loss to the city. Um, so the, the vendor will have to continually reevaluate the areas where photo enforcement is happening and, and tell us if and where it should be relocated. And of course, we would have to review and approve those decisions. Um, the vendor would need to provide training to the police department, the court, the prosecutor, and other officials involved in the use of the system. And of course, the system will have to be fully compliant with the state and local laws. So these are among some of the requirements. Um, now, how do we identify the locations for enforcement? We'd have to work with the vendor and look at the data. Where are the needs the greatest? Where do we see more of that behavior that is um, that, that we don't want? Where do we see more speeding? Where do we see more red light um, being run through? And then, of course, the locations will be reviewed for equity. We want to ensure that there is no unintended consequence. For example, we wouldn't want all of the enforcement to be grouped into only one area of the city because everybody deserves to have this little extra help. And so it's going to be a balance between where the needs are the greatest, where we can ensure that it's not going to be done at a loss to the city where it is at least revenue neutral and and how to avoid unintended consequences and so of course we'll be working with our equity program manager who's going to help us ensure that we go look through everything through the equity lens uh, she's she's already been a little bit um, consulted and well, just at the very beginning here. So of course, along the way, she will be involved and she will help us ensure that, um, that we look at it through the equity lens. And then, you know, just a little note that a safer city is a friendlier city. And so while design cannot change behavior, enforcement can help. So this is our proposed timeline. Uh, which could which could change a little bit, but this is what we are considering for a timeline. So at the end of this year, 2020, we want to publish our request for proposal and select a vendor. So review the applications and all the proposals and select a vendor. And then early next year, we will start a contract negotiation and have a council discussion. Um, 
and then eventually have a council action to approve the final contract. Then there will be a site analysis and selection process, equipment installation, training, coordination with the vendor. So this may take some time, uh, especially with COVID, we don't know when everything will become normal again. So we're hoping things will become normal again before the end of 2021. <laughs> and then, um, once we are ready to get the program up and running, there will be a public notification. This is a requirement that we need to have the signs installed 30 days prior to enforcement. So the signs warning people that there is camera enforcement will be up at the first 30 days. There will not be any infractions issued to, um, to people um, breaking the the rules. And then uh, once, once we're really going and really enforcing the infractions will um, so potentially in 20 starting in 2022, maybe sooner, maybe later, I'm not really sure yet. We're hoping by early 2022, we could get going with having the infractions processed by the vendor, reviewed by the police and issued and then each year we'll have to publish an annual report uh, showing the number of infractions and crashes. And then as needed, we'll have to have a site evaluation and if needed, relocate the cameras or maybe add more, maybe remove some. So it will be an ongoing process that will be continually monitored. And you must have a lot of questions. Um, thank you, Cecile. Do we have any questions? I see Deputy Mayor DeCourcy. Thank you, Councilmember Stearns. Um, a few comments, if you don't mind, and then um, I do have a request. Uh, my first re my request would be, um, since we removed the red light cameras at the intersections, not talking school zones, at the intersections. Do we have any data that indicates the number of incidents we've had at those intersections and the severity of the incidents uh, at those intersections? I'd be very curious to see what's happened since the time we removed the red light cameras. Uh, Cecilia made a very good point that signage does nothing to change behavior. Um, and I can tell you that, and Bob, you can probably back me up on this, but um, even stop signs don't change people's behavior because on the intersection of I Street and 37th Northeast here, where we live, um, we still have to watch very carefully coming out of our manufactured home park because people are blowing the stop signs constantly on I Street going northbound and southbound. I mean, not even attempt to slow down. So I'm surprised we haven't had any significant incidents there and hopefully we won't. Um, I was one who voted against uh, voted for removing the red light cameras. And uh, a few things that I see and that I've heard uh, is that, and, and not particularly in Auburn, but um, we look on the one slide related to the photo enforcement on the other four cities, and it's a uh, good business for them. It's a revenue generator. And if I recall, one in, city in particular, and I couldn't even say which city, um, actually pointed out the reason they did this was for revenues. I'm not interested in revenues. I'm interested in safety and interested in how we can actually, if we did do this again, what the results would be and, uh, and where we would do this to make sure we get the results. I'm very interested in school zones. I think school zones are the primary areas we need to focus on. Um, we're not going to stop speeding, uh, drive down Auburn Way any hour of the day, any hour of the night. And uh, if you're doing 40, 45 miles an hour, sometimes you're past like you're parked. So we're not going to stop that. Um, and as you said, Cecile, you know, you're driving 60, 70 miles an hour on the freeway until a police officer drives by and you go slow down to 60, even though the police officer may be driving 70. So, uh, you know, those things do happen, but that's, that's behavior again. So I would like to see us at least have a, a specific identification as to what those inc incidents are um, and what the severity of them are. 
and uh, and how we can look at that before before I would go forward with it. Um, I, I think again, I would like to see how we would look at maybe separating the program and only doing it. And the option, as has mentioned, doing this in the school zones if and when schools reopen. Hopefully, they will soon. Um, I believe the safety of our children is paramount in this effort. And I would definitely focus on that first before I would focus on even attempting to look at anything in the intersections. So those are my comments. So I do want to make one comment in response to some of your questions on there. We didn't include everything that we had put in the presentation from March, but you might recall that I did have a slide in there that showed kind of the history of the accidents at the three locations that we had the red light photo enforcement. And some of what I talked about in that presentation is the fact that we've done some improvements at each of those locations since the time of photo enforcement that take care of some of the accidents at those intersections. So part of the process in looking at red light photo enforcement does not necessarily mean that those cameras would go back at those same three intersections. It would be looking at where do we actually need it? Where do we have those infractions happening? throughout the city. And part of that is working with the vendor to try to identify where are those locations where we see the majority of those infractions happening that they can actually address with that red light photo enforcement. Right. And then the second piece to that is um, you hit up spot on on what we wanna do with the proposal that we're putting out is that we wanna look at what is it, what can we do with just school zone enforcement? And then what does it look like if we do school zone and red light enforcement? So I don't see us proposing to go forward with just red light enforcement. And from my perspective, I don't see this as, as the end all be all revenue generator because if this is done right, at the end of the program, it should be revenue neutral, right? We should be getting more compliance from drivers so that we're getting less infractions. Uh, and that's what our goal is, to also help PD to actually do the enforcement that they need to do around the city on other areas. So, a couple of yeah, no, I really appreciate that, Ingrid, as well. And again, I, you know, when I, I voted this down last time for specific reasons, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, in, in this sense, I'm not closing my mind to this, but I like to, I know, I want to see us do as you've suggested, you know, some more in-depth analysis on this overall, so we can make a a, a great decision on going forward. Um, you know, if recall when back when we did this. Um, one of the comments that was made from constituents and others who were entering our city was, we had these signs posted all over the cities about uh, red light enforcement. And nobody realized it was only at three intersections. So, I mean, people may have been more cautious than they thought it was all the intersections, but it was only at three intersections. But I've heard, I heard numerous times back then that, you know, well, Auburn's not a very friendly city. Oh, you propose to be a friendly city because these signs are all over the place. That's beside the point. I think, uh, you know, again, a good exploration uh, data analysis and uh, providing as much as you can even now uh, back to council would be more helpful in the decision-making process, but I greatly appreciate your comments. And, and to add on to that, just so everybody understands kind of how the process works is we can't actually get to that analysis piece until we have a vendor selected so that they can go through and do the data analysis. So part of the process is we put out the proposal, we get proposals back for what is it going to cost. We negotiate some of those terms and constraints in a contract, and then you start evaluating those specific sites of where is it actually going to go. So I understand that, I, again, and, and I know you've done some great things to improve the intersections, but I would still be interested in seeing what incidents we have had and the severity of those incidents and not just at those three sites. I mean, I'm thinking, you know, if people have run red lights and have caused either T-bone accidents or any type of accidents, you know, what are they, where have they been? Um, what is the severity of them? Uh, and how many have we had? That's, that's what I'm asking for. And can I uh, jump in really quick? I forgot to let you know that we also have Sergeant Nordanger on the call who is present and ready to answer any police related questions he leads the traffic um, enforcement group. Councilmember Baggett, raise your hand. Councilmember Baggett. Well, just kind of a, a brief thing. I think uh, Deputy Mayor DeCourcy kind of stole all my thunder, but uh, I do concur with most of what he said. And uh, 
and uh, I appreciate uh, Ingrid's uh, comments as well, because that, uh, we have to look at the whole picture. Uh, I, do, uh, I, I do think that one of the reasons why we uh, terminated the uh, red light cameras before was primarily because of the cost of the city. Uh, they were they were not bringing in as much money as it was costing the city to pay for them. That was the real reason. Uh, I'm sure that uh, they did uh, do a, a decent job where they were at. Uh, I also uh, am reminded what uh, Council Member DeCourcy said about the uh, the signage because I know that we'd taken them out at a couple of places and we left the signs up, and it did serve the purpose because most everybody that went through there did slow down a little bit, which did help. I agree with the fact that it needs to be uh, focused on the school areas primarily, but uh, primarily for the, uh, the safety of our children and those delivering and picking up the kids from the school. Um, I, I really would uh, like to uh, look at that operating at no cost to the city at no loss to the city because i think that's that's where the the buck stops and i think if we can operate like that i think i would i would be all for seeing what the uh, contractors that are going to bid on this job uh, would actually bring forth to the table for us to review thank you councilor trump manuel's raised your hand Council member Trout Manuel. Hi, thank you. Yeah, I don't want to repeat the whole thing that council member DeCourcy or council member uh, Baggett had to say, because I was one of them that also voted to take it down for all the reasons that they said. Um, have we looked at the vendors that the four other cities have used? And how many vendors have we are looking at to um, consider you know, having them do this. And um, yeah, cause I also, I just wanna echo, I would rather just see them in the school zones because I have gone different ways and gone by the schools and some of those guards, um, they're out there trying to stop vehicles and people have gone around them. And uh, so if we had something out there, I'm sure we could, um, you know, make it more safer for our students and the people out there. Thank you. So to answer your questions about vendors, we haven't considered any now because we have not yet released our request for proposal. Um, Sergeant Nordinger and I have spoken with other cities and the, um, our neighboring cities are very happy with their vendor. We're waiting to see who makes a proposal and then we will evaluate it and we will we'll do our, our research before we select one that we will feel confident about. Oh, great, thank you. Um, I had a, a question, you know, I, I agreed with um, the deputy mayor about, you know, making decisions based on, on data and evidence. So, um, I, I know we have a lot of railroad crossings and, and is there any reason we're not looking at those and do, is that because the data and evidence shows that's just not an issue or, or is that something we should we could look at? So we were proposing to look at that right now. Um, one of the things to understand on railroad crossings is, is when that arm starts flashing, so before the arm has even dropped, if you go through a railroad crossing while it's flashing, you are technically violating it. So you're, you're crossing and it would be a ticket that would be issued at that situation. So we see some of our um, crossings have more people running around those arms as they come down. Um, but I don't know that that is where our focus is for that, that safety improvement. It's more about the school zones right now. We would, I don't think there's anybody in the state that's actually doing the crossing gate uh, enforcement because it is a little bit more difficult and I think you're going to find a lot more frustration with drivers because I don't know that they all understand that as soon as those flashing lights go off they're not supposed to be crossing those tracks. Okay so in other words it's 
really not a problem, it sounds like. Well, you know, I mean, we have issues everywhere on, on every type of, of traffic movement, um, but I don't know that it is so overwhelming given the number of crossings that we have that it's a concern for us to try to do photo enforcement for. I don't know that you would actually get enough revenue from that situation to pay for the cost of a system at that crossing. Okay. Um, and, and then also, so if there were cameras at, um, I, I'll say like 15th and Auburn Way North, um, there, there's no limit on the number of cameras, right? So you, you could have a camera for each direction, not just one north and one south, you could have them in all four directions, right? Uh, you can have them in all four directions, but you don't necessarily need them in all four directions. So in talking with other cities, they will often have at an intersection a camera going one or two or three directions. And that is really based on the data. If people are not generally running the red light in one direction, then there is no need to have that camera there. And it's just enforcing it in the direction where you see the most problem. And then, um, so the infraction that, that I, I, I'm hearing you, you talk about is for running a red light. Is that correct? Yes, but it's not the same type of infraction that would be issued by a police officer. So. It's the type of infraction that is similar to the one for a parking infraction. And it doesn't right. go on your driving record. It does not affect your insurance rate. Um, so, so it's different. It's, a, I would say, a more minor type of infraction, less impactful. You still have to pay it. And th there's a process, but it's not the same if you get an infraction issued by an officer, it will be going on your driving record. Mm -hmm. These from the cameras will not. All right. Um, so um, whether it's Auburn Way or whether it's um, I Street, uh, the Deputy Mayor mentioned, you know, say it's 35 miles an hour. I blow through that at 50. Can the camera also um, do anything about speeding or is it just the red light? So just red light and just the school zone. However, if our police officers are freed up from monitoring these, then they can be monitoring more locations for general speeding. Oh, okay, great, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Do we have any more questions? Um, I don't think so, wow. Well, great job, I, I really like the background too. It's pretty mind altering. Um, <laughs> Um, I think uh, that, oh, wait, we've got one more um, thing to go. And that is the, uh, thank, thank you for um, Cecile. Um, and then the last item um, is the uh, two-year contract uh, with Ian K Farms to house farm animals that have been impounded by animal control but can't be housed at the Humane Society. And I'm, is that the director Gall, are you? So uh, I can speak on that. Okay, oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. So our, our animal control right now, um, uh, every now and then it's infrequent right now, but uh, we will take an animal into custody. It's, uh, it's under our statute, you know, for various things like animal cruelty, neglect, um, seized during, you know, a warrant process or something right now. In uh, Auburn Valley Humane Society, there's certain animals that they don't have capacity for. You know, if it's a farm type animal, like a, a goat or um, chickens or a horse or some, you know, we still have them within the city um, in some places. And so this contract with ENK Farms would just give us that option of a place to take them. They are currently utilized by uh, both King County Animal Control and Pierce County Animal Control. Um, and so it's it's close enough to the city where it's not a hardship to take them out there, and it's it's another place to house them uh, safely. So we're not uh, our animal control officers aren't spending time trying to find you know somewhere in the region to house these type of animals if we need to take them into our custody. Oh. Great, thank you. Um, do we have any questions about the uh, contract? 
I don't see any. So um, thank you, Assistant Chief. And I believe with that, I'll go back to the Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Stearns. And thank you everybody for hanging in there with us tonight during this long session. I appreciate your cooperation and your involvement. Um, and to all the staff presentations and others, uh, thank you very much for their presentations this evening. Do we have any other discussion items this evening? Okay, good. Any new business? All right, everybody stay safe out there, please.